Welcome to the Exotic Pet Collective. My name is Richard, and today we've got a special guest joining us to talk about tarantula research and conservation and all kinds of very interesting stuff. Uh, but before we get into that, I do want to thank the sponsors of today's show. And our first sponsor today is no stranger to the podcast, and that is our friends over at Arthropod Ambassadors. Now, their aim is to support others interested in bugs and the well-being of arthropods around the world. They're working on spreading education with ResinArt, the Mobile Bug Zoo, and informational YouTube videos, as well as a recent new line of stickers and pins. From compost-enhancing roly-polies to alien-like top predator mantises, arthropods come in all shapes and sizes and are waiting to teach us more about the earth that we all have in common. So if you're looking for a mantis, jumping spiders, isopods, roaches, or assassin bugs, head on over to arthropodambassadors.com and check out what species they have available. You can also find very helpful care videos for your pet mantis, scorpions, vingaroons, isopods, tarantulas, and other arthropods on their YouTube channel, also called Arthropod Ambassadors. You can also follow them on Instagram and Facebook and stay up to date with any new content or species that they may have available in the future. So a huge thanks to Arthropod Ambassadors for sponsoring this podcast. And if you want to learn more about them, I'll link the podcast that we did together at the end of this video or down below in the show notes. And our second sponsor today is none other than TarantulaCribs.com. If you're looking for high-end acrylic enclosures for your tarantulas, scorpions, isopods, or pretty much any invertebrate, then you need to head over to TarantulaCribs.com. They recently restocked their website, and they have some new products coming out in the very near future like larger enclosures. So whether you're looking for an arboreal or terrestrial enclosure, they have a wide variety of sizes for any stage of your invert's life. I use them a lot for my tarantulas and true spiders, and they're my favorite enclosure by far. And if you use the code TCollective10 at checkout, you'll receive 10% off your entire order. Currently, they're only available to residents of the United States, but they are working on international shipping, so hopefully that'll be available soon. So thank you so much, Tarantula Cribs, for supporting this podcast and for all the sponsors today. You guys are awesome and you're integral in keeping this podcast up and running. So thank you so much for your support. Now, today's guest comes from uh, Colorado. She's currently studying under Dr. Hoffbauer and Dr. Redding in the entomology department of Colorado State. She's got her bachelor's in biology from the metro state of Denver. She also has her master's in biomedical sciences and biotechnology from the University of Colorado. I want to welcome to this show, uh, Jackie. Hey. Let me hit the right button. There we go. <laughs> welcome, Jackie. Did I did I get that right? I feel like that was that was a lot. And once I started reading, I was like, oh, I screwed this up. <laughs> No, that's fine. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I guess like the only thing I'd add is like, I'm, I'm a PhD student. That's PhD what I'm student. Sitting there, there. Yeah. <laughs> which degree you're getting? Which letters you're seeking out? I guess. Yeah, I had it matter. written down PhD 2020, and I'm like, I don't know what that means. 2020. <laughs> so I just. Skipped I started in 2020. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> I can't even read my own notes. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for uh, for agreeing to come on. Um, you actually reached out to me. Oh man, I don't even know how long ago was it. Like weeks or months ago? Months. Months. Okay. Yeah, I think it was months. I'm really bad We're at responding. People to pin down. We're busy. We're <laughs> but you, uh, you had. What, do you remember what podcast it was? You had listened to, or was it a video? Or how, how it did was a podcast? It was. Yeah. yeah. I, I we speak. We talk about tarantula conservation so much. It's hard to pin down which one, but I know. Shapes of Nature, we talked about conservation for a lot in that podcast. That may have been it. Uh, I think also, that could have been it. Animals at Home. I think we discussed conservation as well. But um, it, it's good to have somebody on here that actually studies that scientifically and can speak from a place of knowledge. Um, can you just give us oh, a little bit of your background, though, just so everybody is kind of up to speed as to uh, who you are and, and what you study? And, and uh, how, which, yeah, go ahead. I'll let you go. <laughs> Oh, no, sorry. Uh, yeah, so uh, I started my PhD, uh, like I said, in 2020. Um, but before that, during my master's, I actually worked with parasitoid wasps. So my master's research focused on wasps that lay their eggs in, on, or through other insects, um, looking at their genetics. And I developed a molecular biology technique to basically extract genomic DNA from single samples of parasitoid wasps. Uh, without destroying the specimen. So okay. usually to get DNA, you have to grind up things. And uh, this let me do that without doing that. Uh, and then during my undergraduate, I uh, did some more entomology research. And uh, I worked at the uh, the Arapahoe County Coroner's Office, 
Um, and I did some work with how maggots, uh, maggot activity can uh, lead to false forensic findings. So I've had a very gross education. It took a dark <laughs> turn real fast. <laughs> No, we're going to talk about tarantula conversation. You're talking about well, decomposing corpses. Yeah. <laughs> well, then, uh, yeah. So for my PhD, I I keep tarantulas. I have like sixty of them. Yeah. Um, you know, I love them, and I was really interested in them. And I thought, you know, if I'm going to give up six years of my life, I'd like to study a model organism that I like. Sure. Um, and I wanted to do that with tarantulas. Unfortunately, there is not a ton of tarantula research yeah. going on. So. Yeah, we've discussed that a lot on the podcast. It's it's sometimes disheartening and frustrating. But then there are other side of the token, like when research is getting done and things change, people get really upset. Like when, <laughs> especially when tarantulas get reclassified, it's like you should be excited. Like this is a this is good. We're learning more, but you know, people don't. Well, we're lazy. We don't like to have to relabel stuff. I guess it's hard to use that label maker. I hate that. <laughs> Technically, all Linnaean taxonomy is in Latin. And Latin is a dead language, so technically you can never mispronounce. You know, I tell people that all the time. They don't. They don't believe me though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but so, so your current. Wait, I want to back up just for a second. Um, I'm sure you have more to say, but you mentioned that you were studying parasitic insects. Uh, did you study the tarantula hawk wasp? So uh, what I mainly did was sort of general. So parasitoid okay. wasps um, carry a really interesting. Symbiotic, some of them carry yeah. a symbiotic virus. Um, when they when they infect their host, they can have pretty global effects on okay. the host and their behavior, their metabolism. Um, they can cause them to grow faster than their siblings, basically making a nice home for the wasp larva. Yeah. Um, but there's with wasps, as with tarantulas, and with a lot of invertebrates, there's a lot of cryptic, not cryptid. That's nothing. Uh, cryptic <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> species <laughs> that look the same. So um, getting more genetic information would be helpful, but it's really hard to collect a really wide variety um, really rapidly. And of course, with research, funding is always an issue. Yeah. Uh, so a great reservoir for that is museums. Museums have amazing collections and you could access genetic information from that. Mm -hmm. However, you usually have to grind up any sort of sample that you're using and destroy it. Um, or you have to do something that has a lot of reagents involved, like a lot of chemicals involved, yeah. um, which is just costly and time consuming. Okay. Uh, so I developed a method to extract usable genomic DNA from the um, samples that we had, which were very, very small parasitoid wasps um, that allowed us to actually get DNA out of them without destroying the specimen. That's gotcha. what I spent two years of my life on. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, the reason I asked is we had uh, Coyote Peterson on the podcast and he was talking about the tarantula hawk and he was describing how it would sting the tarantula, bring it back into its, its layer or burrow or whatever and lay the eggs. But he wasn't entirely sure if it, uh, if I can remember what the, I, I think he wasn't sure if it just paralyzed the tarantula and it was l alive while the eggs hatched and, and, and the tarantula was consumed or if the venom actually killed the tarantula. And they were just in the carcass. Uh, and that was like, I, I did a little bit of research myself afterwards because I was just kind of curious and I couldn't find any definitive answers. So I was hoping you might know, but. Well, from I what know. I do know, they are still alive. They so, are? Okay. Yeah. Well, that's terrible. Parasitoid wasps are nightmares. Yeah. Sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And they will eat the host inside out, essentially. Yeah. Um, yeah. They'll, they'll keep them alive. You'll, there's a great video from Nate, uh, from Nat Geo on YouTube. And uh, there's a, a, um, I think it's a caterpillar that's infected and you see all of the little wasp larva crawl out of it. And then the caterpillar is still alive. So. Jeez. Yeah. I don't think I want to watch that. No. <laughs> Sounds pretty yeah. brutal. It uh, is. <laughs> <laughs> so out there in Colorado, you're, uh, you do have access to some wild tarantulas, right? You got the, is it the Hensi that's out there? Is there any other species? Uh, we have on the Eastern side of the state. So really in case you're unfamiliar with Colorado, um, anybody is, uh, <laughs> the state kind of gets divided in our minds by the mountains. The mountains cut right through the middle of the state. So yeah, the Rocky I, Mountains divide the ecology in our state, and they also divide it in sort of our own concepts, I guess, of the state. Okay. Um, but on the eastern side, we have a fauna pommel hensi, and then we have a fauna pommel marxi on the western side of the state. All of them are in the south, though. Um, okay. a, 
pretty much about halfway in a little bit, really north of Colorado Springs and even not even that far up. We don't find them. It's uh, really cold and dry here. So. Yeah. <laughs> it's really dry. Keeping tarantulas, I can tell you, if anybody lives in Colorado, like I sympathize with you. <laughs> I think Man. the uh, the main admin for my Facebook group, uh, Tanya Higgins, um, lives in Colorado Springs, I believe. Somewhere in Colorado. <laughs> I, I feel like it's Colorado Springs, but I could be way off. I'm sure she'll correct me when she hears this. Uh, I, I have no experience with Colorado. I, I um, had a layover in Denver once, but it was like an, an unscheduled, like the engine was malfunctioning. So they had an emergency landing in Denver and we stayed there for like three hours, but I never left the airport. <laughs> so I saw the mountains airport. from above. <laughs> it's the airport where there's a bunch of like crazy conspiracy theories about it, yeah. even though it's just, <laughs> it's just an airport. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what, uh, so you, when did you start keeping tarantulas? Like, did you get into spiders and arachnids while you were studying or have you, has this been like a lifelong thing? Well, when I was little, um, my grandfather actually owned a restaurant and we used to get those, like if you ever worked in food service, they have those big jars that, that you buy like ingredients in. Um, and he used to give me those and I'd go outside and catch a bunch of stuff and bring it inside. And then my mother would find out, get angry and make me, <laughs> make me release it. <laughs> uh, my mother's terrified of like, She's okay with the spiders now, but she was yeah. terrified of them. She's super scared of the snakes. I don't yeah. know why. Uh, <laughs> but I always had a I always had a thing for bugs. Um just always thought they were really cool. That's what I would when I got into undergrad, uh, even though I was at the coroner's office where it's you know mainly focused on people. Mm -hmm. Um, I was really interested in the entomology part of it. Um, and then yeah, when I was doing my wasp research, I actually started keeping ants. Ooh. And I think it was through just YouTube. <laughs> So, so horrible to say, yeah, I chose my career path because of YouTube. Um, <laughs> hey, I, I got to say the same thing. <laughs> You're not alone right now. <laughs> well, yeah, I was, I was like watching like ant videos and, you know, yeah. the algorithm leads you to, I think like Tom Moran, Tom's yeah. Big Spiders. And I started watching that and I was like, I want a tarantula. <laughs> 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 I got my first one and then it is Pringles. So, you know, you get... You get one and then you're like, I need more. <laughs> yeah, very true. Yeah, so yeah, was, I kind of uh, got into them and then I realized there's no research on them. So, Did you watch Ants Canada's YouTube channel at all? Yeah. yeah. I I enjoy his his videos and I made a video or I don't know if it was a, I think it was a video or a tweet. I don't know if it was on Twitter or what, but I mentioned him and he left a comment and I was just like, oh crap, you watch my videos. <laughs> I got to be careful what I say because I think one of them I was complaining about you. <laughs> I mean, to be maybe nice. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't mean, but I was like, ah, I'll never watch this. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> he does a great job. Like, I, yeah. I think it's very interesting. Um, myrmacology is like the fancy word because biologists need fancy words for everything. Wait, uh, say so that again. Myrmacology is ants, and like ants are pretty well studied, but there's a ton of ants. Ants yeah. rule the world. So, yeah, there's a lot of them. Yeah. I don't like any of them. I haven't met an ant I like. Just me though. Is there, is there any ants I like? I mean, I think they're interesting. I think that's the thing. Is like they're interesting. Yeah. Like the spiders. I felt like they were more. I guess like I, I anthropomorphizes them more easily. Yeah, I enjoy watching videos on ants. Like I enjoy Ants Canada's videos. I find them interesting. And I think for a little while, Petco with the Dark Den had. He may still. He had a few colonies going. Uh, but personally, like I was really afraid of of spiders and that's kind of like overcoming that fear is what got me introduced to tarantulas and stuff, but it's not going to work with ants. Like, I think I've just had too many bad experiences of, I guess growing up, you know, and, and, and then in my twenties, just being poor, like opening up a drawer and all of your food has been destroyed because it's infested with ants. Like I, I was like, I really hate ants. <laughs> There's no way I'm going to invite them into my house and take care of them. <laughs> they have done so much damage. <laughs> There's no I mean, like, a, like a mature ant colony is a force of nature. Yeah. Like it will destroy anything in its path. If you get ants, like best of luck, because yeah, they're um I mean they're apex predators essentially in their area. They'll they'll just take anything out. I know I with the spiders, I, I live in constant fear of ants and have, yeah. you know, I put petroleum jelly on the bottom of the, <laughs> yep. the desk. <laughs> Spend a lot of time, especially this time of year. Uh just like you know, putting, um, I don't know what that spray is, but around the outside of the house and my wife is insistent that we treat the yard because she hates mosquitoes and, and those get really bad around here. We're also like, 
two doors down from a, a creek. So it's a, oh, yeah. you can get some strange bugs sometimes, but you know, it's like, Oh, I really like our house is a safe haven for spiders. Like our front porch is just covered in spider webs. Like we set up hanging baskets and stuff uh, for the sole purpose of making some web anchors for whatever, you know, orb weavers or whatever is out there that wants to eat mosquitoes and any other bugs. But when it comes to ants, we're like no tolerance there. <laughs> And and roaches. She really she hates roaches as much as I hate ants. So we yeah. no roaches, no ants in the house. That's that's our our rule. Anything else? I can have any other invert, but <laughs> well, yeah. That like that's one good thing is here in Colorado. If the dubia, we have a feeder colony for the dubia, and like mm-hmm. if they get out, they don't do well here. It's too dry. Yeah. So I'm never too worried about that. But I did live in L.A. for a few years, and I can tell you, I definitely lost any emotional attachment to roaches. <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah, they can all die. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it, I don't think it gets so cold here. There's no way dubias would survive. But uh, what everybody was, I mean, the easiest one are the red runners. And those will infest the house like like, in, like no one's business. So I stay away from those. Um, but it's hard explaining to somebody that has, and you know, just this visceral reaction to roaches that dubias are okay. <laughs> or that some of these yeah. other more exotic species, like these won't infest the house. She's like, I don't care. It's a roach. It's like, all right, fair enough. Yeah. We'll, we'll it's it's essences around us. Anyway, <laughs> um, I teach biology. So I'm not a TA like most PhD students. I actually teach at uh, Arapahoe Community College. I teach biology. And I'll tell my students I have spiders. And sometimes there's fear. But then if I tell them I have roaches, then I get really strong reactions about the roaches. Like, yeah. And I get a million stories about how their house got infested with roaches. <laughs> yeah. Uh- Aaron from Arthropod Ambassador sent me some really cool death head roaches and ivory roaches. Um, I think that's, those are the two she sent me. And they're, they're really cool. I mean, you know, big, beautiful roaches. And I thought I could get away with those. I had them for probably like three or four months until uh, I, I got busted. <laughs> I don't know if it was the cats or my son, but one of them <laughs> told on me. And, the smuggling uh, didn't work. <laughs> yeah, they were like hidden in an enclosure under a table. <laughs> and she's just like, yeah, that's not cool. So uh, I got rid of those. Um, it, it just it sucked. Like, essentially, I had to use them for feeders. <laughs> I was like, these are too cool to be used as feeders. But what, what can you do? But um, anyways, uh, I'm not complaining about my wife. Don't get me wrong; <laughs> she is very tolerant. Edit that part out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we all have our our sticking points. Um, I actually lucked out because when I got into this, my boyfriend, I had no, he's not an entomologist. He's just not a biologist. Yeah. Um, and I was like, I want, I want a tarantula. And he was like, okay, we'll get one. And, you know, he was cool with it. I mean, it's his house too. I want to be nice. Yeah. Um, so we talked about it and like, we went and looked and it's me. So I did like a ton of research on it before we got him. Yeah. And then uh, now he's super into him. And now he, the scorpions, he declares all the scorpions are his. <laughs> oh man. I like scorpions. <laughs> Those are pretty cool. Uh, what kind of scorpions do you all have? Um, what do we have right now? We have a forest, Asian forest scorpion. Yeah. And then they're his, so I keep forgetting what he got. Sure. Um, you got a blue scorpion, but I can't remember the exact scientific uh, name. That Caribbean blue scorpion, probably? That's it. Yeah, yeah. I think that's it. I get it. Um, and then we have a Arizona bark. Nice. Scorpion, yeah. So. Yeah, I, uh, I, I went overboard with scorpions. <laughs> it was like, uh, I got an Asian forest and a, um, what's the other one? The... Uh, Emperor scorpion, and you, you, the two basics, very similar looking, very and and I was like, I really want some desert species, and I think it was pinchers and pokies. I went to their website, and they had like Florida bark scorpions, Arizona bark scorpions, striped bark scorpions, uh, you know, like the giant hairy desert scorpion, and it was like, if I'm going to pay for shipping, I might as well like get all of them that I want right now, and and yeah, now I've got. If you count all of the babies, because some of them are parthenogenic or I have them in a communal and it's like, I probably, I have more scorpions than I do tarantulas right now, which is a little overwhelming. (laughs) I mean, most of them are like, you know, two centimeters. I've got a whole lot of babies, but yeah, it's, uh, and I want to do more videos on them. It's just, they're so difficult to film. Like they do not stay still. These are tarantulas can be slow moving sometimes, but those scorpions just bolt and bolt. And they're a lot more, it's like trying to, not as bad as the centipede. Like trying to film a centipede is is next to impossible. Yeah, I can imagine that. <laughs> Die on line one when you have to. Yeah. <laughs> Even if you got bit, you'd be fine, but you probably won't feel very good. Yeah, it would hurt. I mean, I uh, I I'd filmed, I tried to film a centipede for one of my last videos on the uh, Fauna Pelma Calcodes. 
tried to like simulate the Sonoran Desert, and I was like, oh, I really need to get one of these, uh, you know, centipedes in there, these desert centipede that I have. And it Sorry, took. Me oh, that's okay. It was probably an hour or two worth of filming, and I had maybe a minute worth of usable footage. <laughs> it was most of it was the a blurry. Uh, red and yellow streak across the camera, like across the screen, and me cussing, <laughs> just like trying to chase this thing around and get it into focus. It was as soon as I'd set focus, it would go the opposite direction. I was just like, "Oh my god, this is so, this is so frustrating." It did not sign a release, so it was not going to be filmed. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, the, the centipedes are, are one, but I'm like, I really want one, but yeah, I think everyone in my house is going to be too scared of it, and so. Yeah, they, they don't have one. In theory, they're a really cool pet, but in in actuality, it's like I mean, it's kind of like having a fossorial tarantula that you see even less than a fossorial tarantula. Like, yeah, I, mean, I like every three or four months, I'm like, I'm gonna just make sure that centipede's still alive. I dig around a little bit, and then it gets very angry and comes up <laughs> with a little threatening kind of postures. I'm like, all right, you're cool. I'll leave you be. <laughs> Go back down into the substrate. I'm sure it comes out late at night. Like I can tell that it moves stuff around, but it, it's never when I can see it. It waits till it's nice and quiet and dark, and then it seems to come out and explore and try to escape <laughs> all those evil things that centipedes do. Um, <laughs> Writing its manifesto. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Being angry at the world. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, what what is your favorite tarantula? Like how how mm -hmm. like what do you what do you fall on that? Do you like the old worlds, the new worlds? It's a tough question. I understand. It is. And I don't, I, I just thought I don't want to say anything because I don't want them to be upset, but then I realize they can't listen to this. <laughs> They're all going to be offended. I know you They're all offended. <laughs> um, of the ones I have, I yeah. think, um, I love our pokies. I like, I love the pokies. Uh, we have Peter Gallus, but I love those. I, they, I know they're just like the black and white ones, but they're big. And I like the big ones, you know, oh, I love if, if you're going to get a giant spider, get a giant spider. Yeah. Um, so I, I really enjoy those. Uh, I, I, I kind of have a, a hard time choosing like new world, old world. It's so weird saying that too. Entomology, mm -hmm. arachnology, and anthropology are some of the few sciences that still use that terminology. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm always like, maybe, maybe we should change that. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I mean, uh, I have a lot of arboreals. I really enjoy arboreals. They're very colorful. Um, the blue ones, like any blue tarantula, is a big mm. thing, mainly because recently, so the idea that tarantulas are blind, right? Like all tarantulas are blind, sort of the prevailing wisdom of the, you know, mm -hmm. of keeping them, of just anybody that deals with them, oh, they're blind. Um, but recently, uh, last year, they did a study and um, some of them did have opsin genes and opsin uh, allows you to see blue um, is one of one of the things it allows you to do. Yeah. Um, but they did have opsin, they had genes to produce opsin and uh, that kind of lends credence to the fact that they might be able to see something. And yeah. then we also see like sexual dimorphism. So you do see in some, now it goes the other way sometimes, but you see sometimes where the males will molt out and they're really colorful uh, compared to the females. Sometimes it does go the other way, but yeah, just uh, some of the blue ones, I'm always, always curious, especially when there is a lot of sexual dimorphism in any species. I, I really like them because I'm very curious as to why that exists uh, if they can't see. Yeah. Was that you that shared that study on on Twitter? Probably. Yeah, I don't remember. I'm I apologize. I'm I'm really bad with names, and I talk to so many people every day. But somebody shared a um, a research paper on Twitter that was also uh, did did we talk through Twitter or just email? We might have. I don't remember. I, I know. I can actually find out. But I was like well, that, and I think they wrote it maybe. And, uh, I was, I was like, well, this is really interesting and was, but I was frustrated because it was, it was like, oh, it was kind of inconclusive. It was like, we can tell that there's a possibility they can see the color blue, which mean, which kind of, uh, because it was about why tarantulas are different colors. If they mm -hmm. don't see color, like what purpose evolutionary that they that may have. And they were, uh, talking about how blue may have some kind of, um, since they can see color, the color blue. That may have some kind of uh, relevance as to um, the breeding and, and things like that. But they're also like, but that's not confirmed. It could be something completely unrelated that we haven't discovered yet. And I'm like, oh, I read all of this. And then near the end is like, eh, we don't really know. <laughs> so, well, that's the, that's the problem, like, right? Like you can tell it's science because of how slow it is. Yeah. Um, and that's the hard thing too. And especially because there hasn't been like a ton of, of research on tarantulas that isn't taxonomic. So there are tons of papers 
that are mm-hmm. taxonomic papers. Yeah, right. Um, but you have to do this like slow build. Uh, you have to, you know, one paper does not a theory make. You're going to prove your, you're going to reject or accept your hypothesis, your alternative hypothesis, and that's really all you're going to be able to do. And then either you or somebody else is going to have to come along and do more research to prove anything. So, you know, that's just a first step. Um, but with that sexual dimorphism, everywhere else that we see it, usually, uh, and that's with biology too, there's always the caveat of that we know of. Um, and there's always, a, always an exception. Um, but usually it does indicate that there's some preference from the females on, you know, how the males look. There is some preference that, you know, in their drumming, um, there's a few studies out there that talk about, you know, sort of the honest advertisement, which would more indicate like uh, an honest advertisement would be like, it, it does indicate something about the male's uh, fitness. Okay. Um, but like the drum, how, how loud they are, or, you know, certain things that females are looking for uh, when they hear the drumming. But then, yeah, if, if you see some of them, I mean, the females are, are dull compared to the males. And that's usually from now there, there's always the possibility that there's some type of other selective pressure. Like since the males do have to wander because uh, tarantulas do scramble breeding, which is basically, you know, they fire a starting gun and then all the males run. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they, they all just have to find a date. Um, th- since they do scramble breeding and they, and they're outside, uh, there might be something where that particular coloring does help uh, deter predators. Mm-hmm. But I mean, if it's just ornamental or if it's only happening when they're mature and now we know they might be able to see different colors, it starts to add up that eh, yeah. that's a reasonable hypothesis that maybe the females do have some, you know, some selection on their appearance as well. Yeah. There's a uh, nature documentary on Netflix called uh, Colors of Nature. Have you had a chance to check that out yet? I haven't. I mm-hmm. highly suggest it. I, I suggest it to people all the time because it's, it's really interesting. I think it's a David Attenborough. I think he narrates it. Uh, it's only like maybe eight episodes or something. It's not that long, but it's, I enjoyed it because it's like it, it goes to different places all around the world, like different environments. And it tries to, it tries to explain why animals are colored, like they're colored the way that they are. Like there was, uh, for instance, like the Bengal tiger, it's bright mm-hmm. orange with black stripes. And from our perception, our, our viewpoint, our vantage point, it would seem like he would stick out like like a sore thumb. Like, why would you like? What is the the benefit of having a bright orange color when you're a a predator that stalks its prey? You know, sometimes during the day. Uh, and it and when, what they discovered is they, I think it was like the gazelles or whatever the, you know, the, the whatever the animal was that it hunts a lot. Like <laughs> the, the way that it can see, like the colors that it perceives, they actually have cameras uh, that can simulate that. So it would it would show you what the savanna looks like through the gazelle's eyes, and it can see a lot of really good greens and browns. But for whatever reason, bright orange, uh, they kind of see it as like a brown. So when the Bengal tiger is going through the grass, they can't see the orange at all, and it is like almost. I mean, it's really difficult for me to see. Like, okay, where is the tiger? Yeah. And then they switch it back to normal RGB, and then the, you know the tiger is bright as day, stay hiding in the grass, but they can't see it. Like it's it's because they, you know, for whatever reason. They weren't built with that that bright orange uh, receptor, or however that works. And it also goes into uh, ultraviolet colors, like uh, a lot of like bees and and stuff like that that can see ultraviolet. You know, it was like this is what the flower looks like to us, but when you see it from a bee's eye or some other insect's eye, and, you know, that's, that's different fish and, and things like that, it's a completely different world, and and it looks a whole lot different. And it's like the flowers almost look like targets, <laughs> like they're they're, they're just. Uh, enticing these bugs and and bees and stuff to come in there and just different spiders that hide within the flowers to attack the bees Mm -hmm. and how it looks very obvious from the outside. But if you're a bee, like, and they're seeing the ultraviolet spectrum, it's completely camouflaged. And it just, it, I just found that really interesting. And then when I was reading that study, it was talking about part of the reason they, some tarantulas may be blue is because the nighttime predators have very good eye vision or uh, Mm -hmm. night vision. So that's more of a, a greenish color that they're seeing and the blue blends in. Uh, and so it's like very dark and kind of blends in with the background where if they were green, it would stand out as like this really bright, uh, you know, white kind of light or, you know, does, does that make sense? Like it would, it would, yeah. it, 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 it has more contrast. So they would be a lot more visible through like a, a night vision type of predator's eyes. So I thought that was interesting, but then I, I read that while I was writing the script for the green bottle blue tarantula. And I'm like, well, it's green and blue. <laughs> so it's like, 
part of it would be very well camouflaged and the other part would be sticking out like a sore thumb. So, you know, just trying to like figure out in my mind, having no scientific background or ever studying biology, trying to figure this out by reading other people's papers and, you know, websites and stuff. It's, it's really hard to make sense of. <laughs> it's like, just read. That's why it's like, that's what we get told all the time. It's like, we have to stay on top of the literature. So yeah. that's pretty much what we do. Not yeah. Really <laughs> and it's real hard with tarantulas because it's, and I'm sure you can relate maybe more so because it seems like there's, there's not a whole lot of recent information out there or the recent information that is out there is difficult to access, access. Like it's not, not very accessible. Like I, uh, you know, I, I will like make a video and we'll do my research you know, which consists of Googling and going through a bunch of websites and stuff like that. That's, that's pretty much the depth of my research. Um, but I can get some good information, but it seems like more often than not more often than not, but, um, maybe like two or three out of 10, it seems like two or the, two or three facts out of every 10 facts I state, uh, is outdated. Like it, it's been, you know, something, there's been some new discovery or some new research done on that topic. Uh, and that's changed what that fact is. But that information, that research is behind a, you know, kind of some kind of paywall on some academic website that I don't have access to. So it's I will tell you, if you ever want to read a paper and there's a paywall, yeah. um, usually the la- there's a contact author on the paper. Okay. Um, sometimes they're indicated. Uh, sometimes it's just you just assume it's the last or the first author. Um, if you contact them, they will usually share their work with you because oh, we actually nice. don't get paid to publish. Yeah, I did not. Uh, know we that. don't. We don't make money from publishing. Yeah. It's not it's not where the money comes in. All oh, that, yeah. all that, all that yeah. research money. But uh, <laughs> we actually don't get paid for that. So they'd be happy to share their work. So if anybody ever wants to read a paper, um, I think the one with the opsin genes uh, is actually the evolution of coloration opsins in tarantulas, and it's fully at all 2020 in the proceedings of the Royal Society of something, uh, the Royal Society of Biological Sciences. That was nice. the paper. Just to, just to make sure we give everyone credit. Definitely. Uh, <laughs> That's yeah, and that is one thing, like uh, part of the dissertation process is you have to do background research um, yeah. just to support your hypothesis. So we don't want to take wild stabs in the dark. Um, you know, I have some, I have some things that I've noticed with my spiders that, you know, I don't really have a ton of supporting information to make a hypothesis. A hypothesis itself has to be supported by evidence. So yeah. you have to do that background research and, yeah, I mean, it is, uh, there is a thin amount of tarantula research. Uh, there are people that do tarantula research. Uh, Chris Hamilton, um, Brett Hendrickson, uh, Jason Bond, they're well-known in, in the in North America. Um, and obviously there's people that do it all over the world, but yeah. um, they do tarantula research as well. But, you know, it is one of those things where it's academic verticalism, where your, your advisor research something. Okay. So then you end up researching it. And then your students end up researching it. And then there's no real on-ramp for anybody to jump on with a, a new model organism or um, yeah. with any real, you know, really branching out. So you end up with spotty, uh, spotty research kind of, and just sort of a, a, lack, of, um, a lack of good background to build mm-hmm. off of. So we're, we're really at a point where, you know, there is a lot of cool things we could probably find out about them. And there's a lot that behaviorally and, and with their genetics that's left to do, but you know, just if nobody's doing it, it's not going to get done. So. Yeah. And I didn't mean to imply that oh, no. the research isn't done or that people are hiding it or anything. I think it's really <laughs> just a, uh, you know, they're, they're victims of the algorithms. You know, it's like if I'm, if I'm searching um, for instance, uh, the most recent example, I'll probably be offended or I don't know, maybe not offended. That's not right, the right <laughs> word, but uh, you'll probably feel bad that I'm talking about it again, but it's a, it's a, it's a great example. I did a video on uh, the top 10 interesting facts about tarantulas or something like that. Did a lot of uh, Google research. I don't know. I, I feel bad calling it research, but I mean, I, I was trying in my limited capacity yeah. <laughs> and um, you know, and I didn't want just like read one post and be like, okay, that's fact. You know, I wanted to make sure it was, um, it, it was something that had been reported in like multiple publications that were somewhat credible, you know, and like things like Science Daily. I don't know how credible it is, but it sounds like oh, that's it, they're pretty it good. Be. Yeah, they're um, uh, usually they're like a Reader's Digest for science. Yeah, and like National Geographic and you know some other science-based websites. And I was like, well, if there's multiple sources that are talking about this research uh, that was done and the discoveries that they made, it's got to be 
somewhat valid. And what, what it was they were claiming was that uh, researchers had discovered the Afonopelmus amani could secrete a web-like substance from their feet. And it was like one of the only spiders that could do that. This, I guess this research paper came out in like 2011. Uh, but then in 2000, oh, I can't remember. He told me 2015, maybe 2018, somewhere around there. Some other researchers disproved that. Uh, they were like, oh, no, that doesn't actually, this was the mistake they made and they don't really secrete webbing from their feet. But the problem is you search tar like tarantula feet webbing or something like that. You get hundreds of links to all these different websites that either wrote stories on it or, you know, are just like reusing, like reposting that story onto their website or in their publication and no mention of this research paper that came out later disproving it. You know, and, and it's like, yeah. I, I just, I, I was like, and the guy, you know, uh, Martin from Bird Spider CH, he's a great guy. I just talked to him again today. He was like, I'm sorry if you feel bad that I corrected you. I'm like, no, no, I, I appreciate that fact that you corrected me. You know, I, I want to put out the best possible information as possible, but he had to send me a link to that, that paper because I was like, I can't find what you're referencing at all. All I can, all I can find is these people saying that, that, that they do do, they do do that. That's I just, fine. <laughs> I just said do do. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get demonetized. They do that? I don't know how you say that. <laughs> yeah. I'm but, not an English major. <laughs> my, so it's helpful my, having people like him out there that are like plugged into academia. Him and uh, Louis Roque is another one. He's got a Arachnidio Facebook group. He's constantly posting page, like uh, scientific papers uh, that have come out about arachnids. Um, you know, but I, I just, I can't figure out how to get plugged in there. And part of it is it's uh, really boring to read those papers. Like, how do you, how do you get through them? <laughs> So I have a trick for that. <laughs> okay. um, I actually had, I went all the way through undergrad and I, you know, trudged my way through science papers. And then when I got to graduate school, one of my professors gave us this, uh, I think it was from science, um, article that was like how to read scientific articles effectively or something. And it talked about that a really great method is, you know, read the abstract, that part at the beginning, that's mm -hmm. the back of the book. Um, that will tell you everything that happens in the paper. Um, and then read the introduction so you can orient yourself and then skip to the results. And when mm. you're in the results, look at the figures, read the captions, and then, you know, kind of skim the results, get to the discussion. Because the methods and materials, it's good to look at it. If you start to see results that, you know, kind of look weird, um, you can go to the methods. And, and really that, like you were saying with the 2011 paper and then it getting countered by this 2015 paper, that really does prove that, you know, science works. That's what it's mm -hmm. supposed to do. It's supposed to self-correct. And I know there is, as a scientist, one thing that I've noticed <laughs> being in the U.S. <laughs> is there is sometimes an anti-science sentiment. Yeah, I've um, noticed that too. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, no, there's, a, there's that. Right. Um, and, you know, one thing you get told, oh, well, there was this was proven incorrect or this was proven incorrect. Well, the fact that you know that that was incorrect proves that the scientific method worked. It's progress. It proves yeah, yeah, exactly. It proves that that is the the system is in place to do that. And you know, the idea that like re, especially researchers like in entomology or or arachnology are hiding information <laughs> uh, is is just not it, there's just no reason to do that. We are evaluated by our publication numbers essentially. So how many publications you do um and some other stuff. But that is a big part of it. So if you're keeping back information, you're not publishing. And that would be a, that'd be a big no-no. You'd want to make sure you get your stuff out there, um, not only for yourself, but also for everybody else. Because who knows what your, what your publication might spark in somebody else to do. And then you can use their stuff and it kind of can grow on that. And I'm aware I'm not going to live forever. Um, so I always like, I have undergraduates I teach. I have undergraduate volunteers on my project. I'm always trying to, you know, get them into the sort of academic world with um, ecology and arachnology and, and with inverts in general, just mm -hmm. because someday I'm not going to be doing this and <laughs> I need someone to do it <laughs> at that yeah. point. Uh, yeah, but it is a, it's a big, I think it is a big deterrent for a lot of people is um, they're not page turners. The article. No, they're not. <laughs> it, is, it is not a nice relaxing read at the end of the night. <laughs> Cause that's usually when I, I have actually have a chance to read. It's like, you know, a couple hours before bed, we're watching TV. And I'm like, ah, this, my wife watches ridiculous shows sometimes. Like, I do too. That no, I mean, <laughs> you don't understand when I say ridiculous shows. I'm not talking about some crazy reality TV show. Like right now she is binge watching uh, Dallas, like from 1979 like to 1985. 
Do you even know what I'm talking about? That, oh, yeah. Yeah. That, like, that was part in the 80s. <laughs> yeah. That soap opera based in the... Yeah. <laughs> and I get sucked into it. Like, I'm not, I'm not like, knocking, like, dissing or anything like that. Like, I, I'll get sucked into it, too. But it's also, like, this is such ridiculous. This is a, a waste of time. Like, I should read something instead of watching J.R. Ewing, you know, manipulate people. <laughs> you know the characters. <laughs> oh, I know them all. <laughs> <laughs> Never thought I'd ever be watching Dallas, but I don't know how it happened, but she started watching it and I got sucked in, uh, but I'll try reading those papers and I end up falling asleep on the couch because I'm like, at all, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, I don't even know what we're talking about right now. Oh, that at all guy, he publishes all the time. At <laughs> all is the most prolific scientist in the world. Yeah. Uh, so it's, <laughs> but it's also like, I'm I just sorry, feel like you guys need a better social media manager or something. Somebody that can like, you know, do some keywords or tags or something. So it, the information is, is e- more easily accessible. I guess like it's, I mean, I know it's, it's, it should be on me. It's my fault that I don't do all the deep diving and make the connections and stuff like that. But it just feels like it's not that it's really getting hidden. It's just, nobody's trying to promote it. It's, it's, it's hard to kind of get plugged into that scene when you're not a researcher or student or scientist of some sort. Like, I think that's why yeah, Lewis like, has access is he's, he, he doesn't study arachnids, but he's like in biology research. So he has, you know, access to a lot of these websites and servers and stuff like that where you can like put up alerts. So anytime anything, any paper is published that has to do with arachnids, he gets an alert and it's like, Oh, that's awesome. How do you do that? He's like, well, you got to have access to this educational academic server. And I'm like, yeah, that's not going to happen. But yeah. And some of those databases are, you know, like world of science and JSTOR and everything. They're, they're great. It's just, if you're not affiliated with anyone at the time, you can't access them. So um, as I, like, if you ever find a abstract you're interested in, I would just, and no researcher is going to be like, no, I'm not sending you my paper. They'll just be elated that you want to read their paper. Really? We, we spend a lot of time on those and they don't, you know, they don't get, they don't get spread far and wide. So uh, well, oh, is, no, they'll definitely send you a manuscript of it. Well, this kind of uh, brings us to something I was wanting to ask you about and talk about then. It's a nice segue. So thank you. <laughs> it's, uh, there seems to be, and, and it may just be, um, fictional or, you know, like it, paranoia or I don't know. It may just all be in my just head. Just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not just my head. I've heard a lot of people talk about it. Like there's this disconnect between uh, like tarantula hobbyists and tarantula uh, scientists, I guess, like researchers and biologists and stuff like that. Like they see the hobby as a problem. Like, uh, mm-hmm. you know, you guys are, are destroying these animals, whether it's through poaching or black market trade. And, you know, they're, they're they they just they don't they don't like what's going on in the tarantula hobby, so they don't want to have they don't want to be associated with people that keep pets or sell pets tarantulas at least. So it yeah. always feel like there was going to be, and and I've noticed at least on Facebook, which is a terrible example, but that's just my experience. Like where I've tried to engage with some researchers, and they're like, "Oh, you you make YouTube videos about pet tarantulas. I don't really want anything to do with you. <laughs> like you know, we're not I'm not going to talk science with you. You are not an equal. You're not a colleague." So it was like. All right, screw you know, screw you, buddy. I don't know what to <laughs> yeah, say, I mean, but you are like both you. right. Like you are, you you keep at tarantulas and you're studying them. So like, how yeah. it does that exist, or is it just kind of like a rumor that goes around and, and people? It's not really the case. I feel I think there's um, it's distrust on both sides, right? So uh, on one side, yeah, there one of the big threats, and I there's no way to sugarcoat it. One of the big threats to tarantulas is poaching. They get poached. Um, they most of them, when they're poached, they don't survive the transit. It's not like you know, you're saying pinchers and pokies and you know, uh, you're not and everything. When they yeah. ship, they ship them with the full intention that your tarantula is going to arrive at your house and under you know, under 24 hours, perfectly healthy and safe. Sure. Um, when you're when they're poaching them and, and smuggling them, uh, that's not the case. So a lot of times they end up dying in transit. Also, if you've ever had slings, I mean, they're hard to find, right? Like you can have them in a dram bottle and you're, you know, kind of sitting there for an hour and a half trying to find the sling in the yeah. little dram bottle. So out in the wilderness, yeah, you're, you're not going to find slings. Instead, you're going to take um, adults out of the wild. And we don't yeah. want to take, uh, we don't want to take breeding adults because tarantulas have a lot of babies. Uh, not all of them are, are going to be well adapted to their environment or fit. So in the survival of the fittest in, in bio, biological terms, um, means you're uh, going to have the most offspring that survive to adulthood to reproduce and are best adapted to their environment. So it's not necessarily like you can run or lift weights or anything. I always right. use the example. I actually like working out. My best friend, <laughs> she does not want to work out. She does not want to get sweaty. Okay. She has a son. So technically she's fitter than I am. 
Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> I, I don't I don't have kids. Um, so we don't want to take adults out because they've proven that their genes are good. Mm. They have adapted for their environment. They have genes adapted for their environment. They can reproduce. It's a great point. So smuggling, yeah, and so smuggling takes them out of the wild. And, you know, that's not good for them. And as, you know, anyone studying them doesn't want them to disappear from the wild. And so they kind of pin a lot of that on anybody keeping them, not knowing that there is this thriving community of people who are breeding them, that yeah. are keeping them in captivity and breeding them, um, which I feel like we should encourage because if you have, you know, it's like anything else, if you sort of outprice the illegal market, um, I live in Colorado. We know very well that if you outprice an illegal market, <laughs> you can stifle that illegal market for a legal one. That's a very good point. We did yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, and you can you know encourage that. So I um, one of the projects I'm working on is the assurance population for P. metallicas. So assurance population basically means you know you, it's a breeding, it's a conservation breeding program, but it probably wouldn't be a very good idea to release them into the wild right now uh, because the threats they faced before are still there. Um, but you want to keep a healthy genetic. Uh, population. So you want them to not have a lot of inbreeding, to have a lot of um, what's called heterozygosity, basically mm -hmm. a good mix of genes. Okay. Um, yeah. And, and what you would have to usually do, and what we usually consider conservation breeding is zoos. So there's a rhino in San Diego. They're going to ship them to, you know, Florida, and they're going to breed their rhino. Um, but it's not really, uh, not really cost effective for zoos to keep a lot of tarantulas. Um, and especially the amount you'd need to assure a good breeding population and also male rhinos with roughly the same, you know, lifespan as female rhinos where male tarantulas, the clock starts ticking after they mature and yeah. you have to kind of get them out there. Uh, so what I'm trying to do is see about using people that just keep tarantulas. So just captively kept private keepers and get them involved in the conservation efforts. Cause everyone I've ever met that has them does care about their animals, um, they just might not know, you know, what are their best methods for making sure they can encourage their conservation in the wild. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm not going to say it's like a well-hid secret, but there's that, yeah. I mean, that that is something a lot of people ask about. And that was actually one of the long-term goals of, you know, like, when I started the Tarantula Collective was trying to find some way to, to, to put together researchers and hobbyists, as well as, like, artists and creators and uh, you know, people that are making enclosures and stuff like that and try to, you know, make a space creatively, I guess, where, you know, we could connect. So researchers and scientists can help teach hobbyists how to get more involved in conservation and hobbyists could help researchers, you know, with uh, acquiring certain breeds or specimens, you know, and work together instead of being at odds yeah. and, and also like trying to help educate, uh, you know, uh, like Exoterra or <laughs> ZooMed or somebody that makes enclosures for reptiles. Like, you know, those are great, but we need these modifications so that they'll be optimal for tarantulas and trying to encourage that and, you know, make them realize that there might be some sort of a market out there and which yeah. has actually been happening. Like we got tarantula cribs and I mean, uh, you know, he, he started that business in his garage and was like, I don't know if this is, you know, he just essentially wanted to make enclosures that were ideal for his pet tarantulas. And was like, maybe somebody else would want these. And now, like, the poor guy can't keep his website stocked. <laughs> it seems like every time he gets in, you know, some more supplies, they 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 sell out within a week or two. And it's like, you know, so it, yeah, it shows know. there's... <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to get one. <laughs> oh, man, they're they great enclosures. <laughs> he actually just, I'm, I'm excited. Just got, like, right before I started talking to you, he sent me, a, I got an email from Trancher Cribs saying that I got some enclosures on the way. And I think oh, awesome. that they are going to be the the really big ones. I don't even think he's had them on his website for sale yet. So I get to test them out, but like, I, I don't know how big it's like, it's, it's maybe 15 gallon size. Like it's going to be oh, massive. Wow. I want to put some uh, bird eater, uh, Goliath bird eaters in there. Yeah. Um, that's like, I have a, I have two tea stermies and they're at that awkward age when they like don't fit in their herpacult anymore. But yeah. um, the container store, every time I go there, I just want to annoy them. So I always tell them <laughs> they're the largest purveyor of snake and spider habitat. <laughs> they don't like that. No, they, they don't. don't want that. <laughs> it's not interesting to them. Yeah. Uh, but like, you know, you can't always drill shoe boxes and, uh, you know, add latches and tape and everything or yeah. try to try to rip out screens and everything. And it is, it is hard to do that. And yeah, they're at that awkward stage. So that's works. exactly make like, a video, man. I'll watch it. Yeah. I gotta get them into something. <laughs> well, I felt bad because he sent me 
two or th- I think it was he sent me two of the largest ones he had, uh, and I moved my tea stermies in there. Or actually, they're tea blondies. I had two of them. Put them in there, and I was like, oh, this is perfect. Like two weeks later or something, maybe a month later, they both molted, and now it's like, okay, this is I got to get them into a new one before they molt again because it's like they they fit like they're good, but you know it's like a little little cramps. It's you know I'd yeah. like them to have a little bit more room than what they have, and I know that it, when they molt again, like there's they'll just they'll have outgrown those enclosures. So I'm excited to hopefully at, at least one <laughs> that would be fine just to try it out. But wait. Even like something like that, like that is obviously comes from the hobby, but would be hugely beneficial for researchers because culturing them or, I mean, it gets called culturing. It sounds mm-hmm. like you're making a bacteria slide, but yeah. um, you're not making a petri dish. If you culture them in the lab, there's not a lot of information on how to keep them. I actually breed jumping spiders for a couple other labs in the state. And um, I gave them this huge like care sheet about like, you need to get Amec boxes and you need to give them leaves to, to uh, <laughs> web up in and you need to, you know, don't keep them in the freezer. Like they were not in a freezer, but they're in like a, it's like a grow box essentially. It's a temperature controlled um, artificial light yeah. um, re- freezer. It looks like a freezer. Um, they were keeping them in there and they're like, oh, they died. Uh, not mine, but they'd caught some from outside. And they were like, oh, the ones we caught from outside died. And I was like, well, these are a captive line. And also you need to put them in like the window and you need to spray them every day, (laughs) you know, like trying to um, let them know how to keep them. Cause that's a big thing that doesn't get, you know, doesn't get shared is like, how do you keep them properly? Or um, even with researchers, like the observations that hobbyists make, you're around your animals all the time and you watch them very closely Mm -hmm. uh, and you make observations that could lead to really interesting research. But because, you know, if if one side is, or both sides are distrustful of each other, nobody's talking. And, yeah. you know, it's, it's I, I don't want to both sides it, but <laughs> you know, it, is, it is something where I also feel like hobbyists and, you know, I would be mad if I, if, if I felt like this was going to happen, um, like the Lacey Act. The Lacey Act has the best of intentions, but it's not um, with tarantulas because the research doesn't exist. Sometimes the, like, rules they'll make aren't research-based. And everyone's afraid someone's going to come, you know, take their pet. Uh, I live in Aurora and Aurora, Colorado was actually the, um, aside from other things, but uh, we were, we were the ones that pioneered breed bans for dogs. Like they just overturned it. But most of my life we had a ban on like what would account to be about 25% of dogs. Um, Cause that wasn't research based. That was just someone being reactionary about animals and yeah. Exotic pet rules, it's different if you have a tiger in your house to where you have a box with a spider in it, right? Like that's exotic animals, but is that really the same? Right. Yeah, I feel you. I mean, that's such a a sticky situation when Mm -hmm. you talk about like Lacey Act and CITES and and, and things of that nature, because I I feel like most of the people that break those laws are doing it with a good intention, you know, like they're trying to save the species from extinction or something like that, you know, like. I want to import it and breed it and have like a captive bred, you know, uh, base so that if they were to go extinct in, in, the, in the wild, we, they wouldn't just be wiped off the face of the earth, um, mm-hmm. you know, but it, but it's hard to have a conversation with people that in that mindset, that just the fact that you are breeding them and listing them for sale and getting people like putting that desire into people to have one as a pet also benefits kind of the black market, you know, like the, that, that illegal trade, the people that go out there yeah. and poach them and stuff. And I know it's, the poaching isn't nearly as bad as it was in like the eighties and nineties. Uh, but it, it still happens. Like I, I just got an email again today from somebody that bought a, um, uh, I think, it was, I think they said it was a fauna pelma hensi and two weeks after having it, it laid an egg sack. So it's like, that was ripped out of the wild. Nobody grew enough fauna pelma from a spiderling and bred it. And then, you know, a couple months after breeding it sold it off. You know, it's like that, that didn't happen. So yeah, it, it yeah no, no, that's definitely. And I think that people are afraid, like, if someone's going to come take, like, I, I, uh, I won it in a raffle. I did not. I am a graduate student, so I am poor. But <laughs> I, I won a tea saladonia in a raffle. <laughs> and, like, I, I love her. But, you know, I know, like, we had to get papers in case, just in case something ever happened. Um, I never won. I just as someone who, you know, works with people that do the research for legislation for conservation. Um, I don't think anyone's ever probably going to actually come take anyone's pets because it is not a good use of federal money. And uh, it's not like 
we devote a ton of money to conservation anyways. Yeah. Um, so that's probably not a fear people should have. But even the fact of someone saying like, oh, we're going to stop you from buying. These. Like you can't buy them ever again. Um, people don't like that. And no. I don't think it's it's good to make an antagonistic relationship with what essentially amounts to a reservoir of people that would be happy to help with research. And a lot of the projects I've done um, or that I'm doing right now, uh, we have volunteers um, eventually, probably in a month, actually. It's so not eventually, very soon. Uh, I'm going to try to collect uh, hematallica molts from just anybody that has them mm -hmm. uh, so we can sequence them and see how closely related everybody is uh, just to see if there's a healthy population out there that oh, mirrors the wild population. So yeah. anyone wants to send me? Everyone wants to send yeah. me That was actually <laughs> going to be uh, the next uh, question I go into is how people could help. But just real quick, yeah. I want to touch on the T. celadonia thing because that always seems to come up every time. I Not yeah. every time, but it, it's a frequent topic on the podcast. And it's a gray area because it is it is pretty, you know, black and white. You know, like the Lacey Act would made it to where you, they, they're, they're not a species that legally we can have. But under that same logic, there's a whole lot of other Brazilian species that would that would also apply to. But I think because that one is just so popular and beautiful and, and unique and easily identifiable uh, and, you know, it, it got featured in National Geographic or, you know, some magazine <laughs> during the height of all of that insanity. It was like, you know, that's, that's kind of the one species everybody is focused on. And there's a lot of confusion because we, we see that they're getting, sm um, not smuggled, but they're getting, uh, what's the word? Confiscated. If you try to import them into the U S yeah. you know, and some people are facing legal issues because of that, even though they had, you know, they, they did everything that they knew to do to legally have them imported. It was, you know, just, it just, it's, it's, those laws are weird and complicated. And sometimes in other languages, you know, if it's like, we're talking about laws that are written in Portuguese. It's like who in America is going to learn Portuguese and read that, or you know what I mean? Like it's or learn it's, international law, yeah. right? Like I'm not, I do not know international right. law. <laughs> I'm not a lawyer, and I'm certainly not an international lawyer. So yeah, it, it does. It causes a lot of confusion, and you have a, you have a lack of clarity. And like we were saying earlier, like we need to do a better job as scientists reaching out to people. It is not the fault of the general public. It is our fault. Number one, if you have people that really in any any place where people misinterpret scientific findings or they're um, they're misled by other people yeah. um, about scientific information, that's on us because obviously these are people that were uh, that get misled. The people that get misled are curious and they want to know more and they want to uh, they want to learn about something. That's what makes you a good scientist is that you're curious. That's really the. The only, uh, the only prerequisite for starting out. You just be curious. But I think if anybody took the classes I took and did the stuff I did, they'd know exactly what I know. Yeah. So there's nothing like that pre, you know, predestines you to be a scientist. Um, you just want people that are curious. And instead of making the information readily accessible and understandable to everybody, instead it gets, you know, it gets only translated into a language that we understand and that we can talk to each other. We go to conferences. We talk to each other there. Yeah. You know, we we can get into these databases where other people can't. And we miss out on this opportunity, number one, to have a public that is that is scientifically literate, and then to have a public that wants to help us. Because I know the minute I, I Colorado Arachnid Club, uh, Kelly Stevenson runs it. She's amazing. She's actually helping us pair the tarantulas. <laughs> I, have, I just have tarantula keepers on my project, and I just, like, tell my committee. I'm like, yeah, they keep tarantulas. They're cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's a vouch. They're like, what are they affiliated with? And I'm like, nothing. They're just they just keep tarantulas. <laughs> you know them. So, so like, yeah, yeah. We we need to do a better job going out there, talking to people, doing stuff like this. Even I'm not saying I'm like doing a huge public service, but um, <laughs> just doing something where we show like we're not trying to create information that will stop people from doing their hobby. I want to make it better for people. I yeah. I hate it. When I have unexpected deaths, I, it's very rare, but I do occasionally have those unexpected deaths. Yeah. Where you're like, what the death happened? You know? And what happens when they're sick? We just, you know, make sure they're hydrated and hope for the best. But there's not a lot of veterinary care. There's not a lot of information on proper uh, breeding. There's still a debate about feeding frequency when they're mm -hmm. growing up. There's, you know, all these things that we could, we could get information from keepers and they could get information from us. And if we just worked together it would accelerate the rate of which we could find things out. And nobody, nobody in this situation is, 
is actually trying to interfere with each other. It's just when people think you're trying to interfere, they don't yeah. want to help. They actually talked about that in my video today, just how there's, you know, it was one of the top five things I wish I knew before I got a tarantula was that there's really no veterinary care out there. Like, even if you find a vet, you know, they, they could do like some emergency first aid. Like I've seen videos of, you know, maybe a tarantula got on some duct tape on it or something like that. Yeah. And they've been able to remove search. that. Yeah. You know, there's like, there's some basic, like, you know, just, just first aid essentially, but even half of what is out there, it, it's turns out that is it's ineffective. Like, like the ICUs, like when I first got tarantulas, that was stand, like anything is wrong with your tarantula. You put it in a deli cup with a bunch of wet paper towels and able to miraculously get better. And then like after a decade or so, it's like, yeah, that doesn't actually work. Like it, it, they're, not, they're not getting better. Animal. It's just something yeah. that you could do to make yourself feel better. Like you're, you're doing something to help it. Uh, you know, and usually it, if, if, it, if it did get better in an ICU, if you just left it alone in the enclosure, it probably would have gotten better maybe even faster because you wouldn't yeah. be stressed out. Uh, you know, so it's very, very few circumstances that maybe the ICU would actually be beneficial. So like, that's almost become now it's like nobody really does that anymore. It's, it's considered bad husbandry, you know? So it's, yeah. it's, it sucks because you get this pet, you get attached to it and then something happens to it. Like, and, and it just, it randomly dies. And you're like, I don't know. Was it a disease? Was it bad husbandry? Like, how can I, and it's like, they're, they don't run a temperature. <laughs> like they don't vomit or, you know, it's, it's really difficult to like, even tell that they're sick until it's too late, you know? And then by then yeah. you're like, you're like, okay, something's wrong. You call up your vet and they're like, don't even bring that here. Like, I don't even want to see it. Like, no, I don't treat tarantulas. Like, are you crazy? Well, and that's the, the thing is like, we have dogs and yeah. our dogs cost far less than some of the tarantulas. They're basically like, we have rescue dogs. They're basically like handed over to us, right? Like they, people who have, there's too many dogs in the world. Uh, but, you know, our dogs were, the upfront cost uh, was relatively small. Uh, but there's all this veterinary care for them. And it's like, well, people have spiders that their initial investment in the animal was rather high. And I, that was another thing is I had to convince my committee that um, you can sell baby spiders and there's that people will pay money for them. <laughs> Most definitely. There was a lot of confusion about that at first. And I'm like, no, no, no. It's not like a couple dollars. They actually, like, it's like tens of dollars. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, we have all this veterinary care for dogs. We have it. Even, you know, um, setting up enclosures, right? Like this is something where someone can get on the online and hopefully hit on a good YouTube channel or a good blog or a good website that tells them the right thing. But there's also a ton of websites out there that are going to tell you the wrong thing. Oh, that yes, are still telling you to put sponges in their cups and yeah. you know all of that. So you you don't benefit either party if nobody's talking. And I really don't like that. I think that it's just a waste. You know, I. Every person, like in the Colorado Arachnid Club, um, Kelly's been very helpful uh, letting people know what I'm doing and, you know, kind of asking people for help. The minute I bring up that I'm doing this, they, you know, there's like everybody wants to help and um, they have ideas. <laughs> yeah. like, it's great. I love it. Well, how can people that are listening to this podcast, like how can they get involved into helping you with this research and conservation and stuff like that? Especially well, if they for, don't live in Colorado. <laughs> You don't want to go ahead. Well, uh, so when I think I, I if you if you want to share it when it comes out, let me know. Uh, we have to make sure that the IRB at school is cool with us um, soliciting uh, molts from people for P. Metallica. But once we get that approval, um, if someone has a P. Metallica, um, if they want to send their molt to me, uh, we're going to do some sequencing uh, to find again to find out how um, much genetic diversity exists in the captive population that's already present here in the U.S. Um, basically, because if you want to breed them, um, then you could just easily exchange them, essentially. Uh, so if you have a P. Metallica, um, you know, keep a lookout. I will make sure I spread it far and wide on social media okay. um, so they can get those. Um, also, if you're ever in Denver, go to the Butterfly Pavilion. They're great. Uh, Greenville Zoo um, has given me a grant for that assurance population. So supporting supporting zoos and, and other um, grantors that will consider invertebrate work is always really important. Uh, so specifically for the pokies, um, looking at uh, palm oil plantations are really devastating, not only for the environment and the animals, but also sometimes for the people that work there. They're not really good, uh, not really good employers. Yeah. Um, one of the people that actually got eaten by a large snake was at a palm, a palm oil plantation. Yeah. Uh, there's a documented case of it, right? 
Um, yeah, so looking and making sure you're uh, buying products that are uh, palm oil safe. Uh, Denver Zoo has a really great list of products that are ecologically friendly. Another thing is, um, and something I have to make sure I'm always aware of, because it's always tempting to just pick up extra supplies, but cork bark, uh, trying to find um, distributors of cork bark that are renewable, um, that have renewable sources of, of, of cork bark and are also sustainable. Yeah. Um, and environmentally friendly because we don't want to harvest stuff from the wild um, just to make sure, you know, just make sure we have stuff to put in the, in the terrarium. Yeah. And then and making sure you only buy captive bred tarantulas. It's yes. always really, really tempting to get the lower priced one. But if you're going to buy it, I mean, you've said this a million times, I know. <laughs> I watch your channel, so I know you've said this. But um, if you buy a wild caught animal, you have no idea how old that animal is. They're probably not very healthy. Wild animals spend literally, I mean, if you're a tarantula, like <laughs> the time you're a, you're not, a, not when you're born, but you know, you're second in start. Um, everything's trying to kill you, including your siblings and your mom. Yeah. So <laughs> you're you're stressed and you don't get as much food. You don't get a stable uh, environment to grow up in. Just like with humans, our life expectancy has very much improved because you know we're vaccinated as children. We have readily available food. Um, that helps us. It helps them too. So captive bred animals are always healthier. Also, their parents, if they're captive, like a captive line proves that they have the right adaptations to be in captivity. Like some animals don't do well in captivity. Um, but if their parents survived in captivity, it's probably more likely that they'd survive in captivity. So trying to, um, you know, only buy captive bred animals. And then I know some people don't want the, uh, the work of feeding, like, thousands of babies, like if you breed your non chromatis, you're going to just have, yeah. <laughs> they don't skimp on the offspring. <laughs> it's 2,999, you know, yeah. birthday cards they have to send out every year. <laughs> uh, but, you know, and we don't, some people don't really want the responsibility of, of, of feeding them all. Um, but if you do have like mature males, try to throw them in the mix and see if you can get them a girlfriend because it, yeah. it keeps diversity up. You don't want, maybe the same five, six people in your area being the only ones breeding their spiders because very quickly you might have inbreeding. What Part of what I'm looking at is the effects of inbreeding on them because right now we just don't know. But it's best to err on the side of caution. Um, we do know inbreeding affects spiders. Uh, true spiders have been looked at for that. But what effects they, they might have on tarantulas aren't still really well known. But it's always best to err on the side of inbreeding isn't a good idea. Um, so we don't want to inbreed them. <laughs> <Yes>. Deliverance. <laughs> don't have deliverance, Tarantula. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, that's, so yeah, like, that's an issue that oh, I've God. seen uh, a lot in the hobby, at least, is because there's um, there's like a there's a Facebook group. I'll shout them out again. It's called Spender. And and yes. pretty much, yeah, you're familiar? So it's like, yes. you know, you've got a mail or, you know, you're trying to look for a mate. You go there, you post up what you have and you'll find that. But I'm, I'm, I've seen a lot. I don't know how prevalent it is now because I've been, I've been involved in that group for a little bit. Just, focused on my own things, but I, I was noticing that there was like an, somebody would have a male and it's like, they, they don't have a female. They're not going to breed it. Um, so it's just, you know, the poor thing's just going to grow old and die lonely. And so they'll, they'll post it up in there and they'll be like, Hey, I've got a male. It's available for breeding. You know, it's pent ultimate or whatever. And they won't just give it to somebody. <laughs> I mean, like they want you to pay them hundreds of dollars for it. Or, you know, they want half the egg sac or, uh, in spiderlings or something. And it's like, well, what are you going to do you know, with a thousand yeah. non-duchromatis? Or, you know, like, so there's a lot of spiderlings. And you're not a breeder. You're not set up to retail these slings. So, I mean, are you just, are you, you just want something for your mail? So you're going to have people send you, you know, hundreds of spiderlings and now you've got to take care of. And maybe you know what you're doing. Maybe you don't. There's a possibility they could die or you're going to try and sell them. And I think a lot of people just don't realize how difficult it is to actually sell tarantulas as far as mm -hmm. just keeping them alive and then packaging them and shipping them and dealing with customer service. Like that's a whole bunch of work that I don't, I don't want anything to do with. So I'm always curious when people want like a 50, 50 split of a species like that. Uh, you know, so it, I feel like one thing that I can do to kind of help preserve tarantulas or maybe, you know, kind of, in a small way, uh, be involved in conservation is if I have a male and I know somebody that has a female that's looking to breed, like I, I just give it to them. Like you just, you yeah. can have it. Like I'm not going to, you know, I'm just going to watch it grow old and die, uh, but you could, you could use it and, and, you know, prop propagate. What's that word? 
you can propagate. propagate. There we go. <laughs> and so, you know, sometimes I, I would just give them to people that are, you know, established breeders or, you know, retail, like I'll send them to fear not tarantulas or, you know, somebody that I know can make good use out of it. You know, it, even if I'm not going to get anything, you know, like they're not going to pay me for it. Um, maybe they'll give me a couple of slings, but I don't want hundreds of slings like that of the same yeah. species. No, you know, so I mean, that's the, you know, if, if you have to do, if you insist on getting something back for your male tarantula and you know, just ask for a couple of spiderlings, but if it's successful, <laughs> but don't demand a 50, 50 split, unless you're somebody that already has an established business. That's just my yeah, it's, opinion. It's hard to, it's hard to sell them off. Right. Yeah. Like, and well, and that's kind of like another thing is getting the more people you can get interested in them, the easier it would be to sell them off, right? So right. <laughs> try to encourage people to, um, to as, as researchers, like looking at ways that we can get more people interested in them and not just, you know, if you tell some people that invertebrates are going extinct, they kind of care less because right. spiders, right? Like <laughs> right. Bears. it's hard to judge uh, populations. There are still challenges to um, fully assessing populations in the wild because it's easy to like count, um, you know, mammals. We know, you know, we can see them, right? Mm -hmm. um, with tarantulas, you might not see them all. And then one spider has an egg sac and now you've like quadrupled the population. But not all, then probably in the wild, none of them are going to make it, but mm -hmm. there's a small chance that some of them will. Because yeah. it's the same, you have to think about it like that where um, if you can either, there's two options with, well, there's a, Everything in nature is on a spectrum. <laughs> Nothing's not on. Nature abhors a binary. Um, but there's really two options that we say there are is that you can have a K strategy or an R strategy. And basically that's humans will have, you know, only a few offspring and then just devote a lot of resources to their offspring. They'll just, you know, time and money and everything uh, goes into that offspring to help them survive. Tarantulas go the other way. They just have a ton of babies and then hope you know, one of them makes it. Right. Um, <laughs> so number one, the thing to remember is like, if you do breed them and, or even have them, some of them aren't very, probably very good quality. There is a quality versus quantity thing with offspring. Um, if you have a bunch of them, some of them, even in captivity, won't survive. Uh, right. They're just not strong. But yeah, just uh, having, having people know that like, if you breed them, you probably have a lot of them, but... You know, try to find, and even if you do breed them and you just have extras of them, maybe try to find people just to give them to that might like tarantulas all of a sudden. Yeah. <laughs> that's a great way to get people to like them. Just give them as gifts. <laughs> yeah. I don't do much breeding. In fact, I've only tried it a few times um, just because I didn't want to, I just didn't want all the spider links, yeah. you know, and it's, uh, um, I did recently um, breed my T. Voggins and she just a few days ago produced an egg sac. And it was like right in front of my eyes. It was, it was really cool. I was like, she, I came downstairs in the morning and noticed she had done some crazy webbing. Like I noticed the day before she was rearranging a lot of substrate, Yeah, which isn't, it's not like, I mean, it's pretty typical behavior for they them. They do weird but, stuff. They yeah. do weird stuff. Let's just all admit that. Okay? <laughs> the tarantulas are all insane. <laughs> yeah. But to the extent she was doing it, I was like, I'm going to keep an eye on her because I know I bred her a few months ago. Maybe she's, you know, going to make an egg sack. I don't know. Maybe she's just digging a huge hole in the side of her enclosure. But I came down the next day and I saw she had webbed all that up. And I was like, oh, she's either going to molt or lay an egg sack. So I got all my cameras set up <laughs> just in case. I was like, either way, it's going to be, it's going to be some, make some good footage. And as I'm filming her, she's just sitting there and then I just see her abdomen deflate. And then this puddle of this yellow goo with all kinds of little tiny eggs underneath oh her. And God. I was like, Oh my gosh, I just I just caught that on camera. This is amazing. I've seen a Did lot of videos. This? Yeah, this is not great. yet. No, post? yeah, not oh, yet. You have to post this. <laughs> yeah, I still gotta edit it and everything. Like it just happened. And That's uh so cool. yeah, because I've seen a lot of people with they'll they'll like they'll show the breeding of the tarantula and then they'll cut to uh, now she has an egg sack and they they always seem to do it deep in their burrow at night when nobody's they just one day she doesn't have one, the next day she does. So like mm -hmm. to actually be able to see that it was disturbing and disgusting, <laughs> but it was also very cool. <laughs> like <laughs> the worst sort of thing to watch, yeah. <laughs> but it just happened. I, mean, so, I don't know when giving birth is, is a beautiful, well, I mean, I'm not gonna say it's not a beautiful thing, but it, it's, no, it's, no, it's, 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 it's a little gory <laughs> and just seeing, I mean, just seeing the abdomen deflate like that. I was like, did she just die? <laughs> like that's very <laughs> unnatural looking. And I was like, and it was just all this, you know, yellow goo. And I'm like, maybe, because I couldn't see, because it was back in the corner, so I couldn't see it real clearly. But I was like, did 
her abdomen rupture? Like, is that just, it didn't look like hemoglyph, but I was like, I don't know. But then like when I, I got the camera, I got the macro lens on and it could, I was like, those are eggs. Those are little tiny eggs in that goo. This is, this is exciting. And now she's, uh, she's just sitting over there in the corner holding her little egg sack. So, you know, it, I don't know if it's going to, but before, I guess what I was going to say is before I even bred them, I already set up an arrangement uh, with a dealer that I was like, if this is successful, will you take my spiderlings? Cause I don't want to get stuck with them. And they're like, yeah, yeah. If she has a su- successful egg sack, you know, once they're old enough to ship, we'll take them all. I was like, awesome. So we'll do this, you know, but I didn't want to do it and just get stuck with all these slings because that, that would yeah. be a little overwhelming. It, my, my scorpions do that to me all the time. And I'm just like, oh, you this guys. is the parthenogenic ones. Cause yeah. like, they're happy. They're going to reproduce. Yeah. And they're happy. They're going to go for it. You Being parthenogenic stop. really makes it easy to reproduce. <laughs> However. Yeah. I was like, I don't want to like give you bad conditions. So you stop. But I mean, seriously, <laughs> this is like the striped devil scorpion is like had two. Um, it's given, it's, I don't even know. They don't, it's not, I don't know how, how scientifically you say that, but they had a brood. Cause they don't. Yeah. Brood. Yeah. Clutch, brood. A cl- yeah. Well, it's Actually, happened twice. There's really no like <laughs> defining line for tarantula growth either. So yeah. and I've we never, usually have some better idea for insects, but. Yeah. I've never actually seen them give birth or however that works. It's just like, they'll look really plump. And then the next day I check on them and there's little scorpions all over their back. And I'm like, well, I did see the Florida bark scorpion when she was eating some eggs. Like she had a, I guess it's the ones that didn't, uh, uh, do they Develop. hatch? Develop? There we go. That sounds like, it's like, I know they don't hatch. Yeah. The, the, I guess there was the exit. Either they didn't develop or she just was hungry and impatient and was like, I'm going to eat these. Uh, but she had like a bag full of little squirplings and then like four or five eggs in her mouth she was munching down on. It's like, well, that's just, that's just disturbing. <laughs> that's a disturbing thing to watch. Yeah. <laughs> but, and there, yeah, there's another way, like uh, speaking of breeding, um, if someone is in Colorado and wants to help, um, we're actually this month, so there's not a ton of time, but uh, yeah. putting together a breeding colony for a Vic of Vicks, uh, to do research with. And, like, they're not going to live at the Butterfly Pavilion forever. If anybody has mature males mm. <laughs> in Colorado and a Vic of Vic mature male that is looking for a date, um, I'm, you know, let me know because I'll, I'll take them. We're trying to, to get presumably unrelated a Vic of Vicks. So yes. uh, we don't know if, I mean, it's kind of hard to guess who's related. There right. is some temporal separation uh, for maturation for, for tarantulas that evolution's built in uh, or developed um, to keep them from inbreeding, but it's a little bit harder when we're doing it artificially. Yeah, uh, yeah trying to find um, presumably unrelated males because we're, we're going to breed them and then take some of the eggs and use them for uh, feeding frequency research, but then, and, and some inbreeding research, but um, we're going to have extra ones. Uh, so, a lot of those I've like decided like, I'm going to give them to undergrads and then hope they want to help or (laughs) hope they like spiders. So uh, great outreach. So, um, but yeah, like even, even then, you know, that was a big thing when planning that project is like, what do we do with these? And I'm not going to, most of the time in entomological research, at least if you have extras, you freezer them. And I'm like, Oh, I'm not doing that. (laughs) Make something else. (laughs) <laughs> I was not going to do that or use them as food or anything like that. I was like, yeah. oh, no, no. They're going to homes and someone's going to have to raise them because <laughs> I'm not doing that. Um, so, yeah, we, we have some, we're going to have extras. But, like, yeah, trying to make sure we had places for them to go. It is hard when you do that to, yeah. keep, you know, find homes for them. But I think it's important if you if you have males, like, you know, throw their hat in the ring. Give him, give him a good, if that's the last thing he wants. And, you know, that's going to exactly. top out his life just the way he wants it. <laughs> give him a chance. Exactly. You know, that's something that has been, I don't even know how to describe it. Like, it, it's something that I've struggled with because I really would like the Tarantula Collective to kind of get involved in conservation. But when you reach out to, like, World Wildlife Fund or, you know, some of these large conservations, they, they have no interest. They're like, hey, I don't know you. And we don't specialize in tarantulas. so. You know, there's there's a disconnect there. You know, if we were trying to say panda bears or polar bears or something, they they'd probably be be a little more receptive, I guess. But yeah, this is something that a couple of different people we've talked I've talked to on the podcast uh, we've discussed. It, it, when it comes to tarantula conservation, there there isn't a whole lot out there. It seems, or at least it's like easily find. But there are some shady conservation. You know, like people you don't really know, and they're wanting to do something really extreme, and it essentially just seems like somebody that filed for a 
you know, what is it? The 501c? 501c? Yeah, 501c3. Yeah, they, they, they've got yeah. their nonprofit designation, you know, usually out of a state. Not It's not like a federal um, tax exemption. It's like some state exemption. And a lot of times they don't even live in that state. It's just whatever state had the easiest uh, approval I mean, process. Colorado has excellent small business laws. We are very conducive to small businesses here. Yeah. We get a lot of people that do umbrella 501c3. I, it, it's good to find... Um, I mean, there's always like nonprofits. There's, uh, what is that called? Uh, there's like nonprofit, something that will grade nonprofits. I forget what it's called. Oops. Um, hmm. And then also finding like, so I really lucked out. Um, uh, Dr. Hoffbauer and Dr. Reading were incredibly receptive to my idea. That's, you know, they're both uh, conservation ecologists. They do ecology and uh, Ruth kind of does everything, but um, <laughs> Ruth and Rich do everything. Um, they both do a lot of things, but uh, they were fine with me doing my research uh, with tarantulas, which is not something that they do all the time. Um, mm -hmm. And they were very receptive to it. And I, I just was very, very lucky in finding advisors that were willing to invest the, and that's a huge time investment for them. Where every student they have is a huge time investment for them. Yeah. Um, so I'm very lucky in that they are supportive of this. But, um, you know, if, if you're just trying to like look to get involved with it, I think sometimes it is good to try to find a, uh, Organizations that are um, either affiliated with universities, um, that's always a good guarantee because the university has to keep its reputation yeah. and it has to keep its status, its tax status, because it has to do that for funding. Um, or even if there are zoos that have something going on. Uh, the Butterfly Pavilion is actually part of uh, several conservation efforts for invertebrates, uh, one of which is with the tarantulas. So um, if anyone goes to Butterfly, if you Google Butterfly Pavilion, the only thing that comes up <laughs> it's right in Colorado. Uh, they're part of like swarm and um, a coral reef uh, conservation. They do a lot. So, yeah. you know, you can always just look for, for that and, and see if someone, I mean, and, and not always, money is not always the thing people want. Sometimes they just want help. They just need That's true. People. Yeah. Over yeah. the past five or 10 years, there's been a handful of conservation nonprofits that have popped up with, at least within the hobby. And they're not affiliated with any kind of university or scientific research. They're just usually just like hobbyist or, uh, I mean, I'm not going to call anybody out by name because I just don't want to get involved in the drama or give anybody, uh, the, but it, it just, and I'm a very cynical person, I, you know, and, and paranoid and untrustworthy. I'm not, I'm not untrustworthy. I am untrusting. There we go. Untrusting. Untrustworthy would be the other way around. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, I see somebody saying, Hey, I got a nonprofit. We're working for the conservation of tarantulas. So my first, and they're usually followed that by, you can send donations to this, you know, GoFundMe or PayPal or whatever. And I'm like, I'm going to look into this. And like, before I give you a dollar or even like mention you, uh, and then you look into it and nothing, and it's just, it just, it just, it just, like I've dealt with a lot of nonprofits. My wife works for her entire life for nonprofits. So I know all of the effort that goes into getting grants and, you know, accreditations and all this kind of stuff. And they don't have any of that. They're just, they got a 501 C three a or whatever. And they're asking for donations and, you know, they, they're citing like one scientist on the other side of the world that nobody can get in touch with. And that is who, you know, their contact is that's going to help this conservation. And it's like, I don't trust that. So I'm, I don't, but it's like, what else is there? Like, where can I find some kind of organization? And it's not just for me. Like people ask, anytime we do a podcast like this, I get a lot of comments. They're like, we want to get involved in conservation. We want to donate, you know, uh, we want, and especially like, there's a, like, we're doing a meetup in Virginia beach at fear not tarantulas in a couple of weeks. And we're, that sounds fun. Yeah. <laughs> and we're uh, doing like, she's going to have some raffles and stuff like that to raise what? money for a uh, charity, like a nonprofit essentially. But it's like, there's not really a tarantula conservation nonprofit that's reputable that we could raise money for and send to. So it ends up being some other wider, you know, uh, conservation, you know, organization. And usually they don't do anything for tarantulas. <laughs> it's just kind of like they're protecting habitats for other species that tarantulas happen to live in. So it's like, well, that's close enough. We'll go with that. Yeah. You know, but it's like, it, it, it would be nice if there were, if, if there's like, for instance, your research, you know, say that, you know, some of the people listening to this podcast wanted to help support your research. Is there any way people could like donate money, donate time? I mean, how do you, um, how do you we're guys try to do a fundraiser? Yeah. <laughs> I haven't, I'm, I'm so, I'm so like, I, I did not grow up with a ton of money. So I'm always like, I don't want to take people's money. Uh, but we're going to try to have a fundraiser uh, 
probably later this summer. I'm doing field work this summer, and uh, anyone that's in field work knows it literally consumes all your time and coordinating volunteers. So that's kind of been a bit of a time constraint um, because we go out to southeastern Colorado at the Southern Plains Land Trust, and uh, they have a lovely facility, Um, but it is in the middle of nowhere. (laughs) I've been stuck out in the middle of nowhere hunting tarantulas recently, um, which is fun. But yeah, no, yeah, it's a great way to spend your time. Yeah. (laughs) Doing it makes that it hard to get on the phone <laughs> so, and be on the internet. Uh, but yeah, we're supposed to have a fundraiser um, near the end of the summer. So I will definitely let you know um, kind of what we're doing. And a lot of that will probably go to sequencing. So um, I'm hoping to do something called genotyping by thousands, uh, which doesn't require that you have basically a, a already known genome. Um, there aren't a lot of gene of completed genomes or even draft genomes, which would be like, you have the sequence, but is it correct? Um, and certainly not any annotated ones, uh, for tarantulas. Um, okay. Agenicolata, their genome is known, and that's it. There's oh, wow. barcoded ones, but, you know, considering there's over 900 species, we should yeah. probably, probably <laughs> um, But what I would like to do is, you know, um, spend that money basically for sequencing, because that's, that's going to be a cost. Um, that's not something we can do in the lab, because you have to, you know, get the equipment and the reagents. And it, it has, with genetics, luckily, it has gotten to the point where it is cheaper just to send it out, get someone else to sequence it, um, yeah. or you know, get a nanopore and do it with that. So yeah, um, I will keep you posted about that. So um, if anybody wants to help, I'm always happy. If they're in Colorado, um, especially if they're in an undergraduate institution and looking for research opportunities, um, I will give you my website too to put on here. Um, yeah, get I mean, with me. if you can send yeah. me all the links to the stuff we've been talking about, I'll be sure to put all of them down below, like in the descriptions oh, yeah. and show notes and stuff like that, so people can easily access that and. You know, I'll post it oh, yeah. on Facebook and, and things just to kind of help get the word out because I think that would be awesome. And I think it would be really cool to help, you know, at least try to get my audience, you know, maybe we can make a, a YouTube video or something on it to, to try and drive oh, some, some, you know, because I, I know, I know that people want to help, you know, like that's, that's the, that's the frustrating thing is that it's like the, that disconnect, like we were talking about earlier between the hobby and the scientific community. It's, it doesn't have to be that way. I know there's a lot of people that would really like to get involved in donating money or time or resources to help, especially like when you're talking about genetic uh, coding, like, is that, would that help determine um, like species? Like, especially oh, with a lot yeah. of the species that look so similar and it's really difficult. Like is, that would, so that would, dream. that would help that a lot. Right. Oh yeah. yeah. So like I was saying, there's these cryptic, being very clear about that. Cryptid, nothing. Cryptic just means two species or two individuals that look the exact same, but are of different species. Um, But we need that, that information is valuable. It's valuable for a lot of reasons. Um, Number one, there are other things um, outside of just their, the tarantula or the ecology, ecological wealth, the the ecological uh, well-being um, that tarantulas contribute to. There's things outside of that that they can contribute to too, uh, like like medical things, um, things that we more associate with immediate uh, benefit for humans. Uh, unfortunately, yeah. that does happen occasionally in research where it's like, well, what do we get out of it? You know, yeah. as a species, what do humans get? It's like, well, <laughs> not the only species on the planet. So. Yeah. <laughs> like, I've read some interesting articles lately about just different uh, tarantula venom, like uh, the Salmopius uh, venom being used uh, for as a painkiller and uh, the H Max venom being researched uh, for uh, epilepsy, a drug to treat epilepsy, or at least the while researching the venom, they found they were able to chart some pathways or something that triggers epilepsy. And because now they know what I don't know, I'm not a scientist, so I was like, I don't really understand what they're saying. But the takeaway is studying venom is leading to medical breakthroughs. So that's yeah, important. <laughs> what you can do is like you, if you have, so I did a lot of uh, bioinformatics work and like you can do large screening. So you can collect a bunch of genetic um, information and you can screen um, for certain genes that might look like maybe a certain, you know, pharmaceutical you're looking for or something that you're looking for, a marker is what it gets called, a marker that you're looking for. And then you can start to narrow down um, which species might have uh, compounds in their venom that could potentially be beneficial. But if you only have barcoded information, and barcode is um, in your mitochondria, so just one part of your cell, um, in your mitochondria, your mitochondria has its own DNA that's different than your um, what we would like consider your genome. Um, and that you get from your mother, 
but the whole other thing. Uh, you, you have a gene in your mitochondria that helps with um, the electron transport chain. Yeah. You can make ATP. Uh, <laughs> My on. mind is um, bent right now. <laughs> keep it a goog. Uh, <laughs> it's super interesting. But it does, um, it allows us to see, uh, to make some, some distinctions between species. Bearing in mind that you could debate about what really qualifies something as this is a different species from this. Because okay. there is no first, right? There's no first person. Um, just sort of gradually over time, differences accumulate. And now you have a new species. And as humans, we like to label things. So right. we call it. They're different. <laughs> when they, in the wild, if they're still running into each other, it's very likely they'll, you know, they'll reproduce if they Some run into Some gray areas there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's some great research about like, there are um, two similar species living in an area and males that are from the species that tend to burrow under leaf litter are really loud drummers. But then if they encounter females from the open, loose soil burrowing species, when they drum so loudly, the females there actually like them more. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, you know, they become like a super, super dude. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like looking at uh, the genetics would let us know a lot about them and, and clarify a lot of their evolutionary history, you can do a ton um, if you can find out, you know, more about where they came from. A really great paper just came out that looked at um, multiple migrations out of India for our tarantula species that might have led to some of the diversity that we see now. And it was super interesting and it was great. And they used a lot of um, available um, DNA information that we had and some of their own that they had pulled. But it's mainly with sequencing, like it's just, it's costly. Yeah. And you you need samples. So you, now you have to go collect and now you have to go extract and now you have to sequence and now you have to run your informatics for it. And now, you, you know, it's it's a whole thing. Yeah. Um. So yeah, that would be huge. And I think as like an owner too, like I would like to see, you know, who the cousins are. <laughs> so oh, yeah. I'm like, yeah, don't you want to know their cousins? I mean, I was <laughs> at Petco the other day and for $150, I could buy a little card or a little pack thing that I could bring home and swab my dog's mouth and send it off to a lab and know exactly the percentage of all the different breeds that are within it. And I'm like, that's really, that, that would be really interesting. I don't want to pay $150 for it, but no. it, that it would be interesting to know. I'll wait till it's like 20 bucks. <laughs> I'm sure it'll get down there sooner or later. Uh, but yeah, that would be very interesting. And then that's something that, uh, a question that I get a lot at least, and it's usually from people that are new to the hobby. There's uh -huh. a, and I, I blame it on the public school system, <laughs> but it seems like, people have a hard time telling the difference between breeds and then like genuses and species. So they see tarantulas yeah. and they're like, they, they think of it like dogs, you know, like, uh, you know, dogs are the same genus and species. There's just a whole bunch of different breeds within them. So they, they, that's how they view tarantulas. And they want to know like, can I breed my postletheria, you know, regardless with my Gramostola pulchra, I make this really cool hybrid. And I'm like, no, <laughs> like that's not they're from different, <laughs> different parts of the world, completely different genuses. No, nowhere near the same species. Like, and, and it's, it's, un it's unlikely they'd recognize each other as potential mates. There might yeah. be some basic thing they'd recognize, but for all intents and purposes, it's good, probably safe to assume she'd be like, what are you? I yeah. don't know. Just, and it'll just be it. food. <laughs> just yeah, like, I can eat you. Know. I'm breed. What are you talking about? But then there are, the, but that gets muddy when you're talking about, you know, like uh, a fauna pelma species like Hinsey and Calcodes. They're in similar areas. Sometimes they, they're, they're not that distant. <laughs> Uh, and then there was like the whole thing with the uh, Gremistola pulchra and Quiargi, Quargi, mm -hmm. however you say that. Like, essentially, the, there's just the same black, hairy, terrestrial tarantula, just one's on one side of a river and one's on the other. And they couldn't cross the river, so they they they, they kind of like diverged. Is that the right word? <laughs> like, they kind of moved yeah. apart through evolution. And now it's like people are thinking that a lot of the reasons, and this is just speculation. Uh, it could be way off. Uh, but I, I've overheard people talking about the reason... They think that for a long time they were having difficulty breeding G. pulchra in captivity was because they were actually trying to breed pulchra with Quiargi. Like they were, they're two different species, but they looked nearly identical unless you really got down with a microscope and saw some very minute differences. So that, that and they didn't even, I don't even think that Quiargi was described yet at the time. They were just all pulchras. Uh, yeah. so, so that they were like, well, that may be the, so it, it just kind of is an example that you know, different species, sometimes they can crossbreed. Like you see that sometimes with hobby forms of uh, like the curly haired tarantula and the Mexican red knee and stuff like that. That They have the hobby form. They've been crossbred with some other closely related species. But just since I have you here and you're a scientist and this is the example that I use a lot and make, let me know if this is actually anywhere near factual, but it seems to get through to people 
when I when they when they ask this question, I give them this answer. I'm like, you know, so recently somebody on YouTube on a comment left a a question that asked they wanted to breed a Gramostola pulchra with um, a Fonapelma calcodes and make a black super docile tarantula. And I was like, no, you can't. Uh, same thing. Like I was saying, they're not different breeds. They're they're different genuses, different species. I was uh, and the example that I use it seems to get through to people is. You know, a, a parrot and a chicken are both birds, but they won't, you can't breed them. Yes. <laughs> it's like, is that a good example or is that like yeah, scientifically right, like, inaccurate? <laughs> so with, gen- with on the genus level, yeah. on that, so we, we consider, you know, that's a lower, not like it's worse or anything, it's just a lower order. Um, so on the genus level, uh, some animals can be still closely, re- depending on how long ago you diverged, um, can be closely related enough to breed and produce viable offspring. It does happen in the wild. There's hybrid zones. Um, if you have two species that live near each other, you might have an area in the middle where sort of freely these genes still flow in between them, but you have enough where you have enough differences where we say, no, these are two different species, but there's a hybrid zone. I don't, I've never seen, I might be wrong, uh, but I can't recall ever seeing research where someone showed a hybrid zone for tarantulas. Not to say one doesn't exist, there probably is one out there somewhere. Um, but those hybrid zones exist. Outside of a genus, uh, you're a little bit too unrelated at that point. And what you, you have several things that get in the way of um, being that far apart from each other and yeah. reproducing. So one of them, and immediately the, one of the problems is, are they even going to recognize each other as potential mates? We know males take a lot of uh, chemo, um, a lot of chemical cues from the female's webs and everything that they're receptive. Mm -hmm. Um, And then he might not recognize that as like, you know, putting out the welcome mat. Um, She might not recognize the way he drums as the way that she's used to and what she's attracted to essentially. Uh, So they might not recognize each other. Um, They might not have the right uh, kind of body structure um, to mate successfully. And then chromosomally, there could be even bigger issues, right? Like they just don't have the right amount of chromosomes. You can always artificially hybrid. You can sometimes, I shouldn't say always, uh, you can sometimes hybridize things in captivity, you know, like ligers and mules and, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, where they're just not fertile and they're not fit. That's now, that's not to say that in the wild, when hybridization happens, it can't be beneficial. It can. We are, we're hybrids. So we, um, our ancestors bred with other hominid, um, other similar homo is our genus, um, other cousins that we had, and mm. quite, a, quite a few of them, actually. <laughs> Humans, when we meet other species that look like us, <laughs> we do mate with them. <laughs> they don't so always even have that. to look like us, unfortunately. <laughs> Just vaguely look human. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we, I mean, we did that, and it did benefit us, um, obviously. But like, it, it, we don't know that. And that's what that information would be useful for, uh, looking at wild populations and captive populations, looking at their genetics. Are these different species. There's also the potential that there's things that we call different species that aren't different species. So, I mean, I'm short. (laughs) I have dark hair. I have dark eyes. My boyfriend's very tall. He's blonde hair, blue eyed. If something that didn't look like us was trying to categorize us, uh, they might think we're in a different species. That makes sense. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. So it's a lot of information about that. And and really, as keepers and as breeders, probably the best thing to do it's just not hybridize them. Don't exactly. run the risk. Yeah. But do your research and getting uh, like just, just the DNA, kind of like a database of all the different species, like that will really help answer some of these questions and, and kind of avoid some nasty hybrids in the future, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And, and really, we want to make sure that they're genetically diverse, mm. which is always paramount. You don't want, you know, you don't want cloistered populations, populations where nobody is leaving, there's no gene flow. Um, you need that kind of nice mix. Keep stirring the pot. Yeah. Um, you don't want you don't want hybrids because let's say, yeah, like somebody does go extinct in the wild and this is the way to get them back into the wild yeah. is to reintroduce them, which we do reintroduction all the time on other animals. Um, I'm in Colorado. They're, I think they're giving wolves another crack. They're going nice. to try wolf reintroduction. Yeah. yeah. I'm really hoping it works. <laughs> You know, I, like, four. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I say this all the time, like I'm not a scientist. I have no background in science. I, I, I did not study that in college. I avoided 
science in, in college. Aww. I was like, uh, I, I'm more of the philosophy psychology kind of kind of thing. I, think I, t- I did take an environmental science class, though, that I loved. It was so fast. And it was, uh, I went to school out in um, Sioux Falls, South Dakota. So they had, it was like during, um, Chris, it was, it didn't really have Christmas break. I don't know how they do it in Colorado. It's a similar situation. It was winter break. Like the snow yeah. was so bad. It was like for like January, it was like December, January, and February. We just didn't have class. Not um, that. We don't have that. That's. Yeah. Maybe, <laughs> that might be a self It may have just been January and February, but it, it was like eight weeks. It was a long, but you could, you could take a class over winter break if you like stayed in the dorms or like lived in town. And it was, uh, it was essentially like five or six hours a day, four days a week, but it, it was mm-hmm. enough time that it was equal to an entire semester of, of going to class for an hour. So it was, uh, I felt someone that really didn't like, it was, it was mainly the math. That's what I didn't like about science. Uh, math gives me some severe headaches and make, I don't know, I just get frustrated. So I was like, it'd be like ripping off a bandaid. I'd have to take a science class. Environmental science is at least something I'm, I'm a little more interested in than like chemistry or something like that. So um, I was like, I'll just do it over winter break so I could just get it done and over with. And a lot of it was field work, really going out onto frozen lakes and drilling holes and taking samples and determining what was alive in the dead of winter. And, and it was, it was really cool. I really enjoyed it. Um, but yeah, uh, it, it wasn't something I could make a career out of. So like, I, I don't have a whole lot of knowledge there. And I'm also, I don't breed tarantulas or sell them or anything like that. So I don't know a whole lot about that either. So sometimes when, when we're having conversations like this, or I'm talking to people in like the comment section of YouTube videos and stuff, I'm like, I am kind of talking out of my ass here. Like, I don't really know what I'm talking about. I'm just regurgitating when I hear other people say. Um, so that's what I'm going to do right now. Um, talk out of my ass a little bit, but I have just like had, I, I do know a lot of people that breed tarantulas like as a career. And I know that even when they don't, even if they don't get along, cause they're sometimes they're competing businesses and egos get involved and stuff like that. They still care enough, you know, about tarantulas and as, as a whole that they're constantly trading males and females with each other. Um, you know, just like, just so that they're mixing up the genetics and they're they're not breeding in a cloister because I, I know that they're aware of the possibility that some issues could arise from you know too much inbreeding. So I've, I always thought that was really cool that they were so even with competing businesses they're they're very open to you know sending males from you know their from one clutch to somebody else who 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 could use them and and not you know just kind of keeping it mixed up and and yeah that was just I always always respected that I thought that was very cool. Uh, I know- yeah, we, we don't want like what's happened with purebred dogs, right? Like, mm. And the AKC has started trying to reverse course and they they have this whole plan to try to fix it. But um, we don't want that, you know, and yeah. you don't want, um, well, you can have a lot of baby tarantulas. Realistically, only a few of them are going to be breeders, right? There's only a few of them going to breed. Um, so you, you don't have, you don't, it's not like you have just tons and tons to pick from. But you don't want like, you know, you picked up one at the same time somebody else picked up one and they just happen to be siblings or they're half siblings or, you know, whatever. We don't know if they have some way of managing. There are animals that have ways of managing inbreeding because they have to. So there's some ant species that they they inbreed um, and they're fine with it. Um, There are some social spider species that inbreed and they're fine with it. Uh, But we just don't know with tarantulas if that will overall affect their their fitness and if it will and what you don't want is that like you end up getting an animal that's maybe not is now producing less offspring or they're producing weaker offspring and now you're just kind of like a cavalcade of issues um or you're shortening their lifespan or or making them have problems that you don't need and i think yeah i think that's great when people are do still want to you know keep them mixed mixed around each other a little bit but it's hard to I'm sorry, go ahead. It's one thing that I, I've always been, I thought was really cool about tarantulas. Uh, it based, you know, again, in my non-scientific observation. Of, I of think it's been great so thing. far, so I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> but it seems like you have an egg sac, uh, you know, well, first off, you got a, a male and a female, right? And and the male will mate with the female. And if she doesn't eat him, he doesn't have much longer to live anyways. You know, maybe he might go out and find another female, you know, but it's not, it's not guaranteed that he'll live that long. Uh, but so, so he's gone, he's out of the picture. His genes have been passed on and, and he is, he is now died. So you get the female produces an egg sac as those eggs develop it. And this is anecdotal, but it seems that the male tarantulas from that egg sac develop a lot more quickly than the females. So by the time the females from that same egg sac are ready to mate, 
the males will have already matured and probably died. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to worry too much about them crossbreeding there. So it, it seems like in a way nature's kind of figured out how to, how yeah. to avoid a lot of interbreeding, at least within tarantulas. And it seems like, in, at least in my opinion, that would be much more of an issue with captive breeding than, you know, out in nature, you know, because yeah. we are able to sustain males' lives much longer. And, you know, it it, it just, it, it kind of seems like, um, and then, you know, tarantulas double clutch, which is, you know, that, that seems to happen a lot more uh, in, in the hobby as far as, you know, you, you'll have an egg sac, you'll keep a few males from that first egg sac, and then the female will produce a second egg sac, you know, six months later or something like that. And maybe a slowest growing male from the first egg sac can mate with the fastest growing female from the second egg sac. And then you have essentially direct relatives. If that is Even possible. half siblings would yeah. be great. Like you don't want, you know, it's not, um, it's not it, the further away, the better. Yeah. But uh, even like, cousin, you know, cousinal marriage, like marrying, you know, with humans, you can see that, right? Like, don't want to marry your cousin. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't go well. Ask yeah. all the royal families of Europe. Um, right. And just just to <laughs> point out something, I am from West Virginia, and we get that Muslim <laughs> cousin marrying thing a lot. There's laws on the Not books like here that. that you can't marry your cousin, but there are other states that there aren't. So I mean, you, those are the ones you got to watch out for. Hey, no, I was not being regionalist. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a fun little biology trivia fact. If anyone goes to trivia, um, Charles Darwin actually was married to his cousin. Now that just seems ridiculous, isn't it? It was <laughs> of, very common. Of all like, the I mean, people. Yeah, it was more about like keeping money in your family, but yeah, yeah. He, I mean, he was he was a gentried man. He was a you know independently wealthy. Mm. Uh, he had a weird job too, right? Like his job on the Beagle was to keep the captain company, and then he just happened upon you know he was a, he was a good <laughs> scientist, he's a good naturalist, uh, yeah. and he happened upon you know the unifying theory for all of biology. <laughs> <laughs> but and there is back to the original point. Yeah, there is some temporal like temporal separation is what that's called, um, where you have, you know, the females just aren't mature enough uh, when the males are. Now, with jumping spiders, they have shown that mature males will just hang out near immature females mm. and wait. Because <laughs> it's hard to find a girlfriend for them. Freaking so predators. Long as they found one. <laughs> End of a jail. Yeah, so <laughs> this is the kind of guys I keep away from my kids. <laughs> Yeah, right. Like in a human sense, we don't want that. Um, but yeah, no, they'll, they'll get in her little, you know, if you've seen jumping spiders, they make those little kind of, uh, like a little web sack kind of thing yeah. that you sleep in, a cradle. Um, <laughs> yeah, the males will be in there with her and just wait until she matures because then they're first there and they're scramble mating. So they're going to yeah. have to um, find her. Um, and there's all sorts of things in nature where it's just hard to find a date. And so, I mean, anglerfish, have it even stranger, like they're deep, deep sea fish. The males are parasitic, so they'll like latch onto the female and mm. then her skin kind of half grows around him. Ooh. And then he just becomes like testes that are attached to her. Jeez. Very strange. That Nature's strange. weird, man. Nature's it is. I just watched another, I watch a lot of nature documentaries because I'm a nerd like that. But there's <laughs> this, I think Patton Oswald uh, narrated it. It was, it's called Penguin Town or Penguin, wow, I can't believe I can't remember it. Penguin, I think it's Penguin Town. That doesn't make sense. It's about these uh, Antarctic penguins that come uh, and breed on these beaches in South Africa. And there's like one town they, they like a thousand couples descend upon every summer. And like the people that live there just have like given them free range. <laughs> like, so they're making nests in their gardens and, you know, under their porches and, and all this kind of, and they don't bother them at all. It's, you know, it's, it's a really, it seems like a really cool place to visit or even cooler to live. But just like the mating, like, you know, they, they mate for life, but uh, just just that interaction of like finding a mate and then like essentially becoming attached to them and and there's the, the the teamwork that goes into that like watching the nest while one fishes and taking turns and all that kind of stuff I'm like that is fascinating and oh yeah you know and it's just it's cool watching that kind of stuff and learning about how all these different you know species kind of do the mating thing um, but with tarantulas it's like. I don't know. It's uh, it's it's a very interesting. Just the whole. It just seems like because there's so little research, like everything I learn is fascinating. <laughs> the more I talk to people like you, I'm like, this is so cool. I feel like we're like uncovering new truths. <laughs> like, oh, even like they're drumming. Like, uh, I I know that there's some um, more like literature reviews. Right? Yeah. So they're more like looking at past literature and then comparing the um, uh, the information they found about the the drumming patterns that they have, the petty pop drumming. Um, Looking at that and seeing, you know, what is it about that 
that makes female tarantulas interested. Like, I mean, first of all, he's probably doing it so she doesn't jump out of her burrow and eat him right away. Right. So it's kind of, you know, hauling ahead. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> A little self-preservation. I know that. You don't want strangers showing up at your door. <laughs> <laughs> you need to call before you get to the apartment. Yeah. <laughs> but, well, again, you know, I'm, I'm in West Virginia. You don't go up into a hauler unless you're invited. <laughs> Yeah, you really have to be careful there. <laughs> but like, yeah, we, we don't really quite know um, what what that's communicating, like all of that's communicating and really what they're, what information they're gleaning from each other. Because uh, she can reject him. Anybody that's bred him can tell, like, sometimes she's just not that into him. Yeah. Um, and maybe there is something she's, information she's getting from that. Uh, an example for the spiders that always gets used for like really interesting reproduction is jumping spiders. Because we have looked into that more. And is it because they're specific. cute? Is that why science studies them more? Because they're like, oh, they're adorable. We'll study those. <laughs> yeah, they're adorable. And they have a very, um, Wayne Madison, actually, at UBC, at uh, University of British Columbia, does some jumping spider work. And he's like the guru. Uh, nice. He's my guru. <laughs> Maybe it's just me. I found out my master's advisor knew him. And I was like, Dr. Pollock, you know Wayne Madison? Uh, you're geeking out as a science student. Um, but yeah, he does a lot of research like peacock spiders and stuff. I think I think they have a uh, a lot of different um, courtship. Um, there are a lot of aspects to their courtship that we sure. can see and study. Yeah. But we found out like with the males, they'll pretty much dance for anything, and they're just out of range of her jumping length. Ah. So it's really just him checking to see is that a female? Does she want to mate? But then we also found out females they lay down uh, pheromone. Trip lines essentially. They just lay down webbing that's like one thread mm -hmm. that has pheromones for him to follow. And they only want to mate once, but they'll continue to do that just to trick males into coming near them so they can eat them. Ooh, devious. <laughs> oh, <laughs> definitely like a there's like a like a riot girl aspect to study. Yeah. <laughs> I, feel, I feel like I've dated someone like that before. <laughs> Uh, but that's one thing I've been I like I just recently came across. It's probably been discovered for a long time, but just like you know, like when I'm researching something for a video, trying to find cool, interesting facts that, you know, isn't in every single other video out there. <laughs> I've been coming across a lot of uh, references to the chemotactile uh, reception, like in tarantulas. Like uh, yeah. sometimes they're, the setae can actually sense chemical changes in the air. And that, it sounds really fascinating, but that's like as deep as I've been able to go into that. Like, have you done any research on that or have any back? Can you explain how that works? Like, or why? Um, or anything like I'm that? I'm not sure. I would have to check. I will check those so you can post okay. as well. I mean, see if I can find if some. I don't remember ever coming across anything where they looked at the mechanism of action for that in depth. I mean, somebody had to know that, right? And like, yeah. we have chemo receptors too. We have two. Uh, we have our nose and our tongue. Mm. We have we have this ability. So anything that's alive is going to have to respond to its environment. It has to be stimulated yeah. by its environment. And so um, we have two ways that are. I mean, if you've ever had a stuffed nose, you know you can't taste anything. Yeah. So they're kind of intimately linked, but um, we have those as well. What you have to think of with tarantulas is that our sort of our body plan um, is made for a central nervous system, right? Like your brain is right here, so all your sensory organs, for the most part, are going to be right here, and most of them are, except for like touch. Um, and yeah, you have like heat, and you know you can feel heat and pain everywhere, but yeah, your sight, your smell, your taste, your hearing—it's all near your brain. For tarantulas, they have a, a brain, um, but not in the same sense that we do with the central nervous system. We have a we have you know our brain and our spinal cord, and yeah. everybody's going to have to report back there. Um, where with theirs, it kind of gets it's this with the octopus. It's been more studied because they uh, just people seem to like studying octopus. Also, squid yeah. and octopus have very noticeable nerves, um, but they have that. It's this distributed intelligence. It's okay. this. Uh, knowledge everywhere. So they, you know, being able to smell through your feet yeah. <laughs> will give you an advantage, right? Like that gives you a good advantage. Yeah. <laughs> you can, you can touch something. You don't have to get your face near it. You can touch it, see if it's what you want. And then if you don't want it, get away from it. Yeah. And also communicate with each other. Smells a great, we're mammals. Mammals love to smell things. We just love to communicate with smell. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we do. Yeah. Um, so they have that too. And, and most of their world is sort of, you know, vibrational. They, most of their world is hearing through their web and everything. And you can yeah. kind of see your spiders. If you feed them, they'll lay down near the, the web to try to hear better and, and yeah. everything. Yeah, it's very cool. Like, I, I knew that they could sense the changes in, like, air pressure or even air molecules moving. Like, you walk into a room, 
even if you're 50 feet away from the tarantula, there's still, you're pushing air. And it, it may be something that you really, it's, it's not even something that we would perceive as, as a change, you know, but for a tarantula, they're, 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 it's so sensitive. They're like something moved near me or like in this area, you know? So I mean, there's times I walk down the steps to my basement and turn the corner, haven't turned on any lights, haven't said anything, but just my presence moving into the room or opening the door causes enough disturbance in the air that I can, I can see tarantulas diving and hiding, you know, or like, oh, I, yeah. I've got cameras down here, like security cameras. So I'll look out, look through my phone and be like, Ooh, that tarantula's out. And then by the time I walk down the steps, it's gone. And it's like, and I check. And it's like, as soon as I open the door, even though I was really quiet, it, it created this drastic shift in the air pressure or air movement within the room that startled the tarantula and it went and hid. So I like that I find fascinating, but learning about their ability to like smell through their nose or I mean, through their feet or, uh, you know, just kind of perceive a, like a male can perceive a female through the the chemical traces in the air. And I just, I don't know. That's like a part of science that I know nothing about, but it was, seemed really fascinating. And would be, well, we, still be really don't, interesting. we still don't know if he just like, just, he matures. And then one day he's like, well, gonna go out, find me a girlfriend and wander around. We have the in Colorado, everywhere that has a Hensi has this, but Colorado has advertised. Um, we have the tarantula migration every year. Yeah. Um, in, by La Hunta. And, you know, they just, they're all out there kind of wandering. Um, they've done some, uh, some studies with like radiographing where they go. Uh, they seem to kind of just look around until they find her. Yeah. But she, she's probably also laying out like a, a classified ad. Yeah. <laughs> In a way, <laughs> that is something else, but I can yeah. say it. Um, yeah, she's laying out a, you know, everybody's welcome sign um, right. out there as well. But like, yeah, we don't really know a lot about um, about their courtship. And and really, even in the past 10 years, uh, we realized that spider courtship isn't as simple as we thought. They aren't as, um, I think that's another reason they don't get studied a lot, is that people are like, they're really primitive. And primitive in the sense that, so primitive in biology means closest to the ancestral source, yeah. and oftentimes less complicated. Um, and people think, oh, they're not, you know, they're not complex, so what are you going to see about them? When we know that they are adaptive, they will adapt. If you anybody can try this, right? You can take feeders and put it in the exact same spot in the enclosure all the time. Your spider will eventually move over to that spot. Mm -hmm. They know that that's where food's coming from. I yeah. mean, they're not getting into Mensa or anything. <laughs> they're not going to be over there doing algebra. Yeah. But they do have some level of intelligence. Um, so trying to find out like how they perceive the world, um, what they can learn, if they can learn. Um, you know, like when well, we know they can learn, but like to what level can they learn? Um, we know that they also have, you know, maternal care to some degree. Yeah. What is the cost of that? Uh, with large snakes that brood, they found the one study showed that it might not actually be costing her much as far as energy wise um, to really do that. She was going to be sitting in a hole in the ground all day anyway. So might as well do it with the eggs. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we want to, you know, there's tons of stuff we need to learn about them. And the more we learn about them, the more we find out, oh, they're not, as simplistic as we thought. Um, there is a lot of variation there, even among species um, with their behavior. And, you know, another thing I've noticed is uh, when it rains here, yeah, um, it will rain randomly in Colorado. I know like in the East Coast, it will rain all day. Here it will rain for like 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and then it won't rain again. Uh, but that quick barometric change will happen. And I'll go in the spider room and like right when it stops raining, they're all out. Hmm. And they're all like looking around. And I'm like, oh, do you, you must feel that. Like you must feel the pressure change and maybe that's yeah. telling you something, but we just don't know. Right. So, I mean, you've kind of stumbled into a hotly debated just in the pet hobby, a topic <laughs> like, uh, there's, there's, there seems to be, maybe I'm going to call them like the, the old school, the old heads that have that belief that tarantulas are very simple. Uh, you can't teach them anything. They're not going to learn anything. Then you've got like new keepers that are swear that their tarantulas recognize them. And, and then they argue back and forth on social media for days. And, I, I don't like I don't have any scientific you know reference, but I know that just from my own experience, like I don't I don't feel like my tarantulas maybe recognize who I am, but there are certain circumstances that they have learned are like a prelude to crickets falling from the sky. You know, like mm -hmm. just just the vibration of me opening up the enclosure or something like that kind of puts them like um, you know, or even like I just pull out my uh the little container that I have the crickets in and like just the sound of opening it up sometimes like just popping that lid off. 
all if I'm near tarantulas enclosures, they'll they'll kind of come out like, "Ooh, is it time for crickets?" You know, it's like I could, I'm not saying that they're intelligent, but they have adapted to know that right when he opens up the enclosure, the then this weird guy is going to start dropping crickets that I can eat, or you know, something like that. And it's yeah, it's hard to d- deny like that. That does seem like a, a learned behavior. You know, I'm like, I'm not saying I'm going to be able to teach them to like sit and roll over, but they they do recognize that this is the circumstances that prelude crickets falling into my enclosure. I yeah, and I, I haven't ever seen, I know with other spiders, I have seen, uh, with Porsche spiders are, are fairly, or invertebrates, yeah. intelligent. Like when people say like, octopus are the most intelligent invertebrates, not a lot of competition. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, but Porsche spiders are, are pretty smart um, for a spider. Mm-hmm. Uh, I haven't seen anything for, for my gallimorphs actually in general um, at all. But like with true spiders, They've done studies where they put them all in, you know, uniform enclosures and they put their their feeders at the same spot all the time and they moved over to that area. Um, that would be really great, actually. <laughs> hey, if you're an undergrad in Colorado and yeah. you want to come talk to me, I got a project <laughs> for you. <laughs> yeah. um, but like, you know, the, the idea that like, I mean, so you have to, what I would go off of for hypothesis for this is, well, we know that they don't really have, they're not your friend. Right. Yeah. Like I'm sure I love my spiders. It's like attack on Titan every time I come and look at them. I know that. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a scary giant. Um, because they don't really need to have friends, right? Like there's no structure in their brain that's around or anything that's evolved for them to have friends. Humans make connections with other humans because a human by themselves is gonna die. Yeah. Um, you have to have other humans around to survive. So we've evolved to to want to talk to each other, to want to be around each other. Um, that's why we get lonely, you know, like yeah. that helps us. For them, like they're not, there's no real, no real interest in that. So they're probably not even going to have the, the faculties to make a friend. Um, I do something called Skype a scientist, which is kids call you and ask you about your research. And I'm always so delighted because they're, you know, they're still little, so they haven't yeah. been preconditioned to hate spiders yet. So they ask me <laughs> all these questions. And, um, I always get that. Are they your friends? <laughs> like, uh, I don't think they have the capacity to be my friend. Like, yeah. I have the capacity to like them, um, but not the other way around. But like, as far as learning, even like pavloving them, essentially, right? Opening right. the cricket container is pavloving the spiders. Yeah. Um, I've never seen anything where someone's tested that, but I would speculate that you probably they could be because anything out in the wild, you're going to want to learn cues about when food is coming. Yeah. Um, some of that might be instinctual. So, but we have a lot of stuff that we do that's instinctual, that's pre-programmed. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of what we do is pre-programmed. <laughs> <laughs> My friend worked at a haunted house and she was like, it's so funny because, you know, it, she worked there when we were teenagers and I wasn't uh, at all thinking I was going to do this um, as a profession. But um, when we got older, we were talking about it and she's like, yeah, it was really funny because people would get scared and they'd either freeze or they'd run or they'd like swing out at you. They try to fight you. So like, yeah, it's <laughs> Fight, flight, fight, or, fight, or flight, or freeze. That's pre-programmed. You Isn't the the four Fs? There's another one. Yes, my my uh, one of my best friends is a clinical psychologist, and he's like, "Yeah, that's one of them." I'm like, "Um, okay." Yeah. <laughs> somebody somebody shared that on. Uh, in the, I think it was today on Facebook. I saw like an excerpt. It was like fight, flight, feel, or mate. <laughs> I was like, "That's not." Oh, that's the fourth F. <laughs> oh, you yeah, know, it's fight, fight. Freeze and freeze. freeze we we yeah. see a lot, right? What's a deer in headlights? Other than that, the deer yeah. is scared, and that makes sense, right? If you're in, you'll see it with crickets too, because um, we, we always call it the standoff. Uh, we'll put the cricket in there, and then the spider's like, "Oh, there's a cricket," and they'll kind of drift over there, and then the cricket freezes, and so does the spider. And I'm like, first one to move, <laughs> it's gonna do it. <laughs> yeah. So freezing is a good option. Yeah, predators can't see you then. Yeah. Um, a runner or fight them, but like, yeah, there's a fourth one. So, Suppose, but I'm like, how? How would that work? I don't know. <laughs> How does that help you? <laughs> I feel like my dog has done that a few times at the dog park. Like, I'm going to dominate this. I don't want to kill it, but <laughs> I'm going to let it know it who's the like boss. If, if you're with the same, maybe it's like if you're with the same species. Yeah. And like, yeah, I don't know. Um, I'm not we have a, <laughs> our closest living relatives are bonobos apes. Do not Google them at work. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they're, the NS, uh, they're the NSFW, whatever, not safe yeah. at work. Um, <laughs> chimps. They're yeah. like, they're chimps, but they're grass. They're uh, like scrawny limbed chimps. Like yeah. Um, but they are, so common chimps are, are kind of violent. Like right. they are. I mean, for all sorts of purposes, so are humans. Um, 
but bonobo apes aren't. <laughs> they are. Um, they're the sexy apes. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually why we don't have them in zoos. Yeah. Because they are. They're too promiscuous. <laughs> Biology's weird. I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's all right. But there was a, uh, to kind of circle back, there was a big controversy. I want to say two years ago, but with COVID, it could have been three. I don't know. My, my time management or like reference is kind of screwed, but oh yeah, there was uh, people, there, there was like a trend of people putting ping pong balls in tarantula enclosures because they felt like it was stimulating to the tarantula because the tarantulas were like rolling it around and moving it back and forth in their enclosure. Uh, people felt like they were having fun. Uh, but then you had other people on the other side were saying, no, you're, you're stressing out your tarantula. It's just trying to get it out of there. Like it's not playing with it. It's, you know, so it was, it, and it was, I mean, they would, people would get nasty over that stuff. And it's like, Hey, look, neither one of you have done any like actual scientific research. So you have no idea if you're right or wrong. Like these are just, we're, we're picking hills to die on based on opinions. Like, um, yeah. But I mean, have so so. I mean, have you heard of any kind of uh, research, or uh, you know, maybe just uh, maybe it could just be opinions that tarantulas need some kind of like, or can benefit from stimulation, like a stimulating environment, or is it, do so, they play with toys? <laughs> I guess is what I'm asking. Do they want toys? Like, it's PS, stop PS5? trying to sound smart. <laughs> do they need PS Five? Do they need that? <laughs> uh, so I. I think so. I've actually never seen anybody research that. Like, if they need, a, if they want a toy, <laughs> mammals. We know mammals like to play. We know some other, like birds, like to play. Yeah. Um, really intelligent birds, like crows and ravens and, and uh, certain parrots, love to play. Um, I mean, as far as like stressing them, I think we've we've associated the word stress with like toxicity. Yeah. Um, and it's not. Uh, you you are built to have stress. You are supposed to have stress. Like that is normal. Yeah. Uh, that you don't want prolonged stress. That will hurt you. But even as humans, like stress just means trying to overcome something, right? Like you just have something uncomfortable in your environment. Um, tarantulas are really good at conserving their energy, so I don't know if they'd really want to play. <laughs> that would be that would be kind of weird. But they're really good at like not moving. <laughs> they're excellent not movers. Yeah. Um, and then obviously like adults might be different babies or whatever. But um, I've never seen. A, if that's the case, here's the scientific thing about if you have an idea, um, until evidence can be presented to the contrary, then that to support an alternative hypothesis, the null hypothesis stands. So case of point, is it stressing them or are they playing with it? No and no. Yeah. They're not doing either. <laughs> we know they're doing something. Yeah. Um, Try it out what? sometime. You got a new world terrestrial, throw a ping pong ball in there. See what happens. I actually did that because um, last year at AAS at the American Arachnology Society's conference, we had it online, obviously. Yeah. But I spoke to um, the gentleman that ran the um, the uh, National Zoo. Um, he ran the, like the Smithsonian has a whole spider thing. Um, and he had done that. He'd been the curator with that for years and years. And uh, he'd re just retired because I think he was like, eh, COVID's happening. They're going to make me leave anyways. Yeah. Bye. Yeah, he was like in his mid-70s. And he's like, yeah, you should put ping pong bongs in there. We used to do that with them all the time. So I did it, and they played yeah. with them. One of them tossed it. She just, like, put it in an old water dish she didn't want and, like, ignored it. Yeah. The other one, she's been moving it around and, like, <laughs> <laughs> having a good time, I guess. Yeah. it's it's. But, I mean, that, that kind of gets down to the core argument, which I, I feel like in a lot of ways kind of separates different types of, like, the, there's two types of keepers out there. <laughs> Not to be binary, but uh, there, there are, the, uh, like, I don't even know. There was like the taxonomical and the hobbyist, like the people that keep all of their tarantulas in tubs labeled with scientific names stacked, you know, and you can't even really see them unless you pull them out and open them up and stuff like that. They, 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 you know, are more into, I don't want to say like the science aspect, but a lot of them are breeders and, and they like collecting just different species. And then you have people, I mean, kind of like myself that really enjoy creating an enclosure that's naturalistic and kind of simulates the environment and is, visually appe appealing. Um, and I know that a lot of that I am just doing for myself, like for my own enjoyment. Like I enjoy looking at the tarantula and I want it to be in a really cool display um, that that looks kind of, you know, natural, not even though it's like fake plastic plants or something. It's it's still an attempt. And and you get this, you know, just people and their personalities, but you have people that are saying you have to keep them in a naturalistic environment for them to be healthy and safe. And then other people saying, no, all they really need is a water dish, some substrate, and a hide. And anything beyond that is super, superfluous, superfluous, 
I'm making up words. Superfluous? Uh, I just, you just should come on the podcast and pronounce all the words for me that I can't. Oh, no, because there are some words that I can definitely not pronounce. Yeah, it's weird. Like, it, it's in my head. The, the, the words are coming out very smooth. But for some reason, when I talk into this mic, all of a sudden, my, my, it's like, nope, you can't say those words. There's too many syllables in it's that. It's a word. lot of stress. It's a stressor, <laughs> see? Yeah. But you survived. So that's yeah. great. <laughs> so scientifically, do you, when you all are keeping tarantulas for research, I mean, is it just like in a Tupperware container with dirt and a small hide? Or, I mean, do you all provide a more naturalistic kind of environment for them? So I work with the Butterfly Pavilion, and they're yeah. an AZA facility. So they're an American Zoo, um, Zoological uh, Association facility, mm-hmm. which means they, they abide by the rules of the zoo. Okay. Um, the zoos must abide by. And one of those is um, that they have to be kept in an environment that is stimulating and as close to their natural environment as possible. Gotcha. Now, a real, like, a really strange thing is that we don't know a lot about soil preference and um, other kind of microbial. We, as humans, we have this thriving uh, microbiome, right? Like, we are an apartment building for microorganisms. Yeah. You have more cell by cell. If you sorted out all your cells, uh, there aren't a lot of human ones compared to, there's more microbes living on you than there are your human cells. So that does keep you healthy. Um, so we really don't know like if uh, what kind of other symbiotic or mutualistic relationships tarantulas might have with plants. Mm. Um, or There's one avicularis species that they do know has a symbiotic relationship with a bromelid plant. Um, but like the, the research I'm doing down in Southeastern Colorado, you know, there's just not a lot of information about like soil preference and uh, plant preference, shade preference, slope preference, you know, all these different things where if you're house hunting as a tarantula and you plan to, you know, especially the fall of a you're going to dig a hole and live in it for the next 30 years. Yeah. Um, you better pick a good hole. Uh, we don't know. So um, their, their obligation is at the Butterfly Pavilion is um, to get as close to, to what we would know is, is accurate. Hmm. But I think also, uh, if you, the tarantulas must at some point realize nothing else is coming in the enclosure but food. Yeah. <laughs> like, I can't imagine they don't start to think, oh, this whole thing is mine. Because like, yeah. nothing else shows up. We're in the wild literally every day. A bird, a baby spiders are, are bird food, right? Like they, they're, that's their main issue is other birds or other mm-hmm. insects. So, you know, every day someone's trying to come get you, um, you'll, you'll start to realize what's your area and what's not. And now, as far as like, um, even like a boreals, I think giving them cover, we do know they like cover. Um, they don't want the sun right at them. So trying to give them a dark spot to be at, um, giving anchors to web on so they don't, you don't have to kind of, be sort of kind of like how they want it. Um, giving them enough substrate to dig if they're fossorial or even if they're terrestrial. Like, yeah. I know some people like to keep them on shallow substrate so they can see them, but like how comfortable are they? They're, it, what all you're doing that is causing prolonged stress because they feel exposed. Right. It's like a dog, right? Like you don't want your, your dog might like sleeping under a desk because it feels enclosed and they like that. Yeah. And you see that with, um, uh, it, it's, it, it's not so much, the st- like I think what it is 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 there's a lot of people that believe tarantulas don't require any stimulation. So whether it's playing yeah. with a ping pong ball or having some fake plants in their trees or you know cork bark to climb over and around, like they just don't think that that's necessary and it's just a waste of money that could be spent on more tarantulas. And you know I like I understand where they're coming from, but it's also like you don't like like you were just saying if if you don't have the scientific data to back it up then it, the what would you say it was null like the null yeah no the null, the null so you have two yeah. hypotheses you have a null yeah. and an alternative and you're actually trying to prove the null hypothesis you're trying to prove yourself wrong as a scientist gotcha. you're not trying to support your so I, mean, I just maybe i'm doing it backwards then but like the way I, it's like i don't know if they need it or not but i'm going to err on the side of caution and give them that stimulation not this so much the stimulation like i'm not i don't have ping pong balls and like i, I threw a couple ping pong balls in an enclosure just when it was like it's Height of popularity just because I was curious yeah. to see what was going to happen. Uh, but I do provide everybody with at least some kind of plant or decoration or something to, to mix it up so it's just not straight substrate, you know? Like, uh, I, yeah. And it, like, again, it, it, a lot of it's just for my own, you know, visual appeasing. But, you know, it, I, I also think that they, there's got to be some kind of benefit for it. Like, 
I mean, it's a two dollar plant I got from the Dollar Tree and washed it with some Dawn or something. You know, it's like Dollar Tree is the best store. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and, and that is true. Like we don't. So it's kind of difficult because like we don't have a study, right? Like, no one's went and made methods and checked on this and everything. But I know what I'm observing, so I can start to ask questions often. And that's exactly how the scientific method works, right? You have an observation, you make an observation, you start to do a question, you make a hypothesis, you're going to do your, your um, experiment, and then you're going to look at your data, and you're going to reject or accept your null hypothesis, and then you're going to go make another question. Yeah. <laughs> like just on and on. Um, so we do see observations of them doing things. Like, I have spent time thinking I'm making this beautiful enclosure. <laughs> <laughs> and then I put the spider in there. They look confused for a little bit. And like you get that one, I think this one time we like did foam and latex and, um, you know, like texturing and everything and covered it with, with uh, cork bark pieces. Like I broke up this big thing of cork bark just to make a little den um, for one of my uh, um, arboreals. And I was like, oh, she can nest in this little den. Uh, she completely did. Like right. <laughs> just completely did. <laughs> or they'll just rip the enclosure apart. I know some people keep live plants. Mm. with the spiders but i'm like yeah they're gonna rip that plant out (laughs) (laughs) i don't want that um they have there's some type of of environmental preference they have if they're modifying their environment yeah it has to be something and there's general things we know they like every animal especially if you're potentially prey likes to have cover um they are nocturnal so they're gonna want it to be dark Mm -hmm. um you know, they want areas where they feel like they can anchor. They want substrate that again. They want substrate that they feel is going to absorb water, and they can hit a water shelf. Um, it's just really hard when we we don't know in the wild. It's like the same with food, right? I'm so sorry, about my dog. It's, okay. <laughs> it's the same with like food. Um, in the wild, they're ambush predators. Yeah. So it's pretty much anything that comes along that is slightly smaller than you, or you think you could take them, you're gonna eat them. Um, where I try to mix it up with ours, but I'll never get as close to, you know, I don't use vertebrates to feed mine because namely I don't want to clean it up. Yeah. But, uh, cause yeah, yeah it's no <laughs> <laughs> I've actually done it a few times. Just, just to, like I, I post Letharia or Nada. She had a, she was just really big and somebody gave me a little, uh, house of knoll, like a little feeder lizard from the pet store that yeah. got their kid as a pet. And then they were like, oh, he doesn't want it. I was like, well, I don't want it, but my tarantula needs to eat. So maybe this would be an interest. So I threw it in there. It ate it. And then it, you know, it was a, just a, a disgusting mess. Like what did it left over? I was like, yeah, we're not doing that again. <laughs> like we're just, we're sticking with uh, just crickets and mealworms and stuff. I'm not, what did I'm it look like? Was it just like the skin and like No, the blood it was like, it was like it, 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 I mean, it was, she's a big spider. I mean, she's full grown. So, I mean, she, most of it, she digested, but what was left was like, this carcassy, it was like, it was a green lizard, but what was in the bottom of the enclosure was like black and, and it almost looked like it was like charred or burnt. And then there was like, in like some guts, like intestines and stuff like stuff like that. She didn't, it was just, it was a nasty mess of, of nasty, gross, yeah. like terrible. Well, the, and, oh, oh. <laughs> well, they, they, I mean, they, they have external digestion that happens. Yeah. So it's like yeah. half digested, like nothing that's, even partially digested smells good. Yeah. <laughs> well, you any, see that a lot. I've seen people feed tarantulas like raw chicken pieces and raw steak and, you know, m- live mice and I mean, all kinds of stuff. And it's like, I'm, I'm not doing that. <laughs> it's like, I'm you never, mean, I don't want to clean it up. Yeah. I would never do a mouse just because there's a 50 50 chance the mouse is going to win and depending on the size of your tarantula, you know, like they're, oh, yeah. my mice can bite. <laughs> they're, they're quick, they're strong. I'm not taking that that risk. But with the lizard, though, it was it was complete. I mean, he was a small, little, tiny lizard with a huge nine-inch postlotheria tarantula. So it's like he didn't stand a chance. All, all you had was speed. But you know, in there it was. I and honestly, I thought it would make an interesting video, something like that. Of it, it would it would be cool to watch the hunt and kind of talk yeah. about the the benefits and the, the pros and cons of feeding you know lizards or, or vertebrates and. It just like it was just a disaster from the very beginning. Like the lizard froze, the tarantula froze. I stood there for three hours with the camera. I'm like, all right, nothing's happening. I walk away. I'm on my computer like an hour or two later, and then I just heard the commotion of 
a tr- huge tarantula running laps around an enclosure trying to catch the lizard. <laughs> and then by the time I got my camera and got over there, it was it already caught it and was like behind a cork bark in the dark. And I'm like, well, that just didn't work. <laughs> and then like the next morning, had that nasty mess to clean up. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not doing this ever again. I yeah, like the, the, I mean, in the wild, the rodents and, and lizards and whatever are yeah. open game, right? Like you wander too close, I guess you're going to get eaten. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like in, inside, I'm like, um, I don't want to deal with it. And I don't have all the wonderful scavengers that nature has exactly. to come eat whatever is left over from there. <laughs> it looks disgusting. And I just, I just, I don't know. Like, I, I'm always worried too. It's really warm in there. And I'm always like, is there going to get maggots or, you know? Maggots show up fast. Like yeah. flies show up fast. So <laughs> if you have anything left over, they'll they'll lay, you know, maggots will lay eggs on there or, or flies will lay eggs on there. I don't want well, we are we're we're getting pretty long on time. Oh sorry. Here. Oh my gosh, I'm sorry. I have to like two hours. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> that always happens. We get, get talking and then before you know it, two hours has gone by and it's like, all right, we should probably wrap. I mean, if this was the Joe yeah, Rogan show, we go like three or four hours, but I don't think many people listen more than a couple hours. We're like, all right, this is getting on. Uh, I could literally talk about this all day. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, the the remedy to that is just to have you come back on again for another podcast later Anytime. on. Anytime. Yeah, Anytime. that would be very cool because there's still a lot of, a lot more stuff I wanted to talk about and I'm sure people are going to listen to this and have a lot of questions. So it'll kind of, kind of feed in. So we'll definitely have to have you come back on and, and talk some more because this, was, oh, this yeah. was very interesting. I really enjoyed this conversation. And well, so next thing maybe we can do it from the pavilion so you can actually see the butterfly oh, pavilion and yeah, their breeding room. Cool. They have like this huge spider breeding room yeah. that I'm going to eventually sneak into and live in and hope they don't see me. Yeah. <laughs> that might be, uh, I might just have to like make a trip out to Colorado and check it out for a video. Because, you know, it's, 90% of the people that listen to this aren't, or not 90, half the people aren't watching the video. They're just listening on Spotify or something. So they don't have you know, any, they wouldn't see any of the cool stuff we're looking at, but yeah, that would be very, that would be very cool. Oh yeah. Anytime. Cause I, I mean, I'm always happy to talk about spiders and especially about like the research I'm doing and show yeah. stuff to you guys. Like if um, we have field work, I, you don't want to do that. You don't want to drive out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> but with I'm some doing that. I'm going to um, Sky Island, Arizona. That's not the, that's like the Sky Island, Island region, somewhere outside Tucson, in between Tucson and the border in the middle of nowhere. Uh, bugs in cyberspace, Peter and uh, uh, who was uh, uh, shapes in nature, <laughs> Jesse. That's his name. <laughs> they like bought property down YouTube there. Name? What's that? Did you just call them their YouTube name? I did. <laughs> <laughs> that's how I know everybody. I know him by the, their YouTube name, and then I learn your real name later and then try to, yeah. <laughs> no, you're, no, you're more than welcome to come out anytime and film anything we do. Um, yeah. nothing secret, it's not like a big secret. Um, and I'm sure like the students I have working with me and the volunteers, they would love to share what they're doing. Um, I'm cool. happy to, to show you that you have to come to the butterfly pavilion though. Cause it is amazing. Yeah, definitely. As, I mean, I I'm really, not just saying that cause I do research with them. It's yeah. a huge invertebrate zoo. Wow. They actually have a tarantula walk you can go on and you can yeah. hold Rosie and you get a button <laughs> that says I held Rosie. That sounds, that sounds like a good time. I would definitely enjoy that. And I've been wanting to go and go to Colorado anyways. Uh, like, I'm going to Arizona, so maybe I could try and, and fit that in somehow. Yeah. While I'm oh, we're west. actually pretty close. Yeah, yeah, we're actually pretty close. And and once you go to Arizona, once you come here, it doesn't feel hot. There you go. Right now, it's a little hot. But <laughs> not but compared yeah. to Arizona, where it's the surface of the sun. Yeah, that's why I'm going in late September. Because I was like, oh, oh yeah. wait till the temperatures are done. Because I actually, my wife and I honeymooned in Sedona. And we went like September 22nd. Like in that, it was like into September, beginning of October. It was perfect. It was like cool in the evenings. Didn't get much warmer than like 85 during the day. I was like, I could live here. And people were like, <laughs> no, not in July and August. I'm like, yeah, good point. <laughs> no, I went there one time. I had a layover. I went outside and I was like, nope, too hot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, even yeah. then, we flew into Phoenix. It was 103 degrees. I'm like, Sedona's saying that it's like 78 right now. How is it 103 degrees in Phoenix? I'm like, well, you're in the middle of the desert. I was like, yeah, all right. No. But it was, no. even at that, it wasn't that bad. Like, it wasn't like 103 degrees in West Virginia, where it's just 100% humidity and you're miserable and want to die. At least it was like no humidity. <laughs> so, yeah, I went to Hong Kong once in the summer. Yeah. And like, I have curly hair. This is an hour of work. <laughs> so I got off the plane and I was like, Afro? Nice. <laughs> and super hot. And I was like, not for Jackie. Okay. Yeah, no, thank you. <laughs> no. 
<laughs> so you're going to send me, uh, or I'm going to get links to a lot of the stuff you were talking about, mainly yes. the uh, the butterfly pavilion. Your um, the, I'll send you my website too. It's awesome. not awesome. It's super amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we'll have all that information linked down below. Uh, whether you're watching on YouTube or you're listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, just check the show notes. Uh, we'll have that link down there. Um, or just go to the Tarantula Collective Facebook page. I'll make sure to have a post there with all of uh, the information, and stuff that we've been talking about, and links to Jackie's website and all that kind of stuff on there. So we can, everybody can kind of get on the same page, which would be really cool. Because I know people are very excited about anything that can help with conservation and research. Um, I know there's a lot of people that want to get involved. They just don't know how. So I, I yeah. appreciate you coming on and talking about this. It's been really, it's Absolutely. been really cool. Thank you for having me. This is really fun. I love yeah. this. This is great. Awesome. Again, I could, I could talk about spiders all day, but this has been even better. Yeah. <laughs> I obviously I can talk about them all day as well. Even if I don't know what I'm talking about, I just didn't. Started a whole YouTube channel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we'll definitely have you back on. And what would be really cool. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one thing I'm I'm trying now that COVID's over, going to try to do a lot more of these in person uh, instead of like virtually. So that that means I get to travel as <laughs> you start showing up at people's places. Like, hey, let's do a podcast, shoot some videos. It'll be fun. So you may actually uh, you may have to deal with me in person uh, in the near I'd future. I'd be happy to have yeah. that. But, and there's um there's like lepsteria of, or like what? I got science uh, butterfly people and oh, beetle okay. people and. Every people at the Butterfly Pavilion. So yeah. if you're like, oh, I want to film your bugs, they'll be like, yes, <laughs> I'll <laughs> awesome. jump on you for it. So. Yeah. Well, thank you all so much for listening and hanging out with us. This has been a lot of fun. Uh, you know, all those, like I said, all the links will be down below. If you want to hear more of these podcasts, be sure that you're following me on, you know, the follow the Exotic Pet Collective on Apple, Spotify, anywhere you listen to podcasts or subscribe to the channel. And uh, I will be uploading videos every Thursday, a new podcast every Thursday. So thank you everybody for listening and we will see you next time. Goodbye. I said bye. Oops. Ah, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> you said it. Goodbye. I didn't say bye. Oops. You can say it now and I'll edit it in. Okay. Ready? Go. Bye. There you go. <laughs> That was going to be sound really strange. Oh, oh, sorry. It'd be smooth. <laughs> to be honest, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take that little trend, that little interaction we just had about you saying, oh, should I said goodbye? And then recording the book. <laughs> and that's just going to be the, the very end. <laughs> when the, when the credit, Everyone's going to know I'm socially inept. Great. <laughs>